Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. All right, guys, we are back with another episode of Table Talk. Before I get started with my guest today, I want to thank a couple of our sponsors. The first sponsor is MerrickHealth.com. Merrick Health is a preventative medicine and hormone optimization telehealth platform that if you guys have been following the table talk, I hate, I, I hate going off the script stuff. If you've been following the table talk, you know what I'm talking about. They have self-service labs and they have guided optimization. If you use the self-service labs, you want to go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The labs that are set up are the labs that basically any doctor, and we can speak about this as we continue with the uh, podcast because I have a doctor sitting with me. <laughs> These are the labs that they're going to be looking for. So if it is a self-service, you can at least get the labs and you can even get an extra report, which will explain everything. And then you can use those labs to speak to your own doctor. I'm not going to sit here and tell you to figure it out yourself or to Google it or to have your personal trainer or online coach read your labs because that is stupid. <laughs> Don't do that. All right. They, other, they also have the, the option for guided optimization where you'll work with your practitioner that will mediate between you and the doctor of what your goals are, what your levels are, what tests should be done. Maybe you don't need the self-service test that's in there. Maybe you need other tests, all based upon what your goals are and what your objectives are. And then they will send you to one of their doctors that will either help you with your prescription needs or supplement needs, or just tell you to get in better shape, that you're too fat and all these other things that could be part of the issues or if need be, help mitigate the damage of what you're doing. The other sponsor is obviously EliteFTS.com. To go back to Merrick, a 10% discount on your first order, code TABLETALK, um, EliteFTS.com. Discount code, 10% off your first order. What I wanna push out there is we currently started running, running Better Than Black Friday offers on Monday. We just flipped them today and my brain died and I can't, bands are 40% off, there's one, and there's a couple other ones. These better than Black Friday deals, guys, they are, they are what they are. They are better than what they're gonna be on Black Friday. The reason I do it this way is I can take some of the traffic and some of the influx that we would get on Black Friday and push it out throughout the month. We're not the biggest company in the whole world. I really don't want my staff coming in on Thanksgiving to be able to push through Black Friday orders if they don't have to. So this mitigates some of the orders and the way that I do that is by offering a bigger discount during the better than Black Friday offers than I do during Black Friday and Cyber Monday. So head over to EliteFTS.com. Now, today, on to the guest. And for those people that put timestamps in the video to just like skip over everything I just said, piss off and go someplace else. But before you do that, <laughs> hit like or subscribe and hit the notification button because it is the sponsors that help support and pay for the show. My guest today is Dr. Trevor Fetner. If you get it right. Yes, right. All right. Yeah. So if you listen to the podcast I had with Mike, Dr. Mike Israel, we spoke a little bit about you and then we mm -hmm. spoke about you after the show as well. Yeah. And he's, he's one of our he's one of our coaches and he's a doctor. You got to have him on because he's a former he's a washed up meathead, kind of like I am. Right. So <laughs> there's a lot of different avenues that I have notes here to be able to go down. But really quick, I just want to say that this is this. I don't want to say a real doctor, right? Because it, <laughs> no, you can tell Mike yeah, he's not a real doctor. That's yeah, fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, he earned that title. It's just different. Yeah, I mean, he's got patients that he sees every day. Yeah. But the, the cool thing with this is, you know, when you have a, a, a doctor in, that's seeing patients every day and is also working in the field, helping people as an online coach, trainer, mm -hmm. and with nutritional needs, it's a weird space and there's probably not a whole lot of people that do that because mm. typically 
the doctors that we'll all see, you go in and they don't like what you're doing as far as training wise because it's evil, it's bad. Yeah. You know, and if there's any <laughs> hormone use, everything's because of that. Even the cold that you just got, it's because of that. Um, you feel both spaces, yeah. you know, which gives a very unique perspective mm -hmm. on a lot of the situations because. I can sit here and tell stories, you know, about meatheads that go see a doctor. Yeah. Like, yeah, this meathead went to see a doctor, and the doctor <laughs> said X. But you never wonder if the doctor really knows and was the meathead, like right. what the doctor actually is really thinking. Yeah, no, that's true. So, um, and, and, and thank you. Yeah, I, I feel like I do kind of bring a, a unique perspective in that regard. So um, I was involved with lifting from... I guess my brother got me started in middle school. Um, I was kind of a fat kid, so he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to the weight room. Maybe you should come along with me. And I said, okay. You know, I looked up to my big brother and everything, so we, we got to training, started getting a little better shape. You know, hitting puberty helped. All of a sudden, I was taller and, and not as chunky, um, but really took to the weight training part of it. And I was always, like, trying to train for football, and, you know, everything was for football. You know, weight training, wrestling, track. You know, I was the same coach for all three, so he was really pushing everybody to be in it. Um, and then after high school, I got involved with powerlifting, actually through Mike Isretel. Um, he was the president of the powerlifting club at the University of Michigan. So he kind of got me started, got me on a program. Uh, after he left, I just kind of kept going with it. I took over the powerlifting club. So by the time I got to med school, I was already you know, a couple of years into the sport and carried that through during school. It was like a big stress reliever, you know, being able to compete and train. Um, through med school? Through med school, yeah. That's actually when I was at my strongest. So it was one of those things where, and I tell patients this a lot, you know, it was kind of almost like a control thing for me because, you know, so much of my day was out of my hands. You know, I went to, to med school in Fort Lauderdale and I grew up in Southeast Michigan. So my whole family was 1500 miles away and stressed out and, you know, I'd be in class for eight hours and I go to the gym for three hours. Cause I was like, you know, when I'm in the gym, I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. You know, it's up to me to, you know, I'm, I'm lifting the weight or I'm not, you know, it's, it was a big control thing. It was comforting. It was fun. I was able to stay connected to that community that I really enjoy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I met a guy named Mark Lesman. Like he goes Bennett Lesman. He kind of switches his name sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so I met him actually through through Brian Schwab. Yeah. Because so I knew that you know I was going to South Florida, and I said, Hey man, I know you're in Orlando, but do you know anybody? He said, Yeah, actually, one of my training partners. He goes to school in Nova. And I said, Well, shit, man, that's where I'm going. So I got hooked up with Mark and he introduced me to multiply lifting. So that's where things really took off. So where did you train at the time? Then did you train at Brian's place? No, I, I mean, I've been there twice to, to train, but yeah. it was uh, just the university gym. Okay. Yeah. So it was in retrospect, a little reckless. Yeah. <laughs> so like, well, multiply in a multiply. university. Yeah, so oh, no, wait a minute. Wait, we need to back up here yeah. for a minute. All right, so the university gym, do you mean like, you're not talking like the rec center, right? The rec center. Are you shitting me? Yeah. He had already, he had been there for a year in law school. So he got in good with the, the guys that worked there. So we had like a makeshift monolift. So like, it was just a rack that had pins. We'd stand up, these guys would pull the pins, we'd squat, put the pins back. And mind you, Mark is, I mean, he's strong as hell, but he was six inches shorter than me. Mm -hmm. And so I do my set. We lower the pins. I put the bar all the way down. He would do his set. We'd unrack the weights, stand back up, put the pins back in. It was it was a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of fun, but it was like pretty hairy. And then bench day was even more kind of ridiculous because it was just him handing off to me. And then his girlfriend would hold the boards, and that was it. I mean, how does this? I mean, this. <laughs> yeah. You know, I went to. Um, Bowling Green, Toledo, and I guess those are the only ones that really had like a rack yeah. type center. And they're, they're smaller, right? And they're smaller schools than what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, like kind of blown away right now, right? Because <laughs> I was like, you're, you're, you're 308, man. You're, you're a 308 pound, right? Is the multiply will, at the time. So 275, yeah, 308. 275 for most of it. The, the biggest I got was like 295. Okay. That was like Thanksgiving day, 295. Yeah. So yeah. you're walking in with an oversized duffel bag full of bench shirts and all this other kind of crap <laughs> and boards. And you probably got to yeah. bring chains and bands if you're using that shit yeah. in there too, right? Into a rec center. Mm -hmm. like, in South Florida, no less. Everybody is like <laughs> super fit plastic surgery some of them you know total like beach bro kind of thing <laughs> and then there's us <laughs> you know we had just eaten mo's burritos and then we go train and then we go get chick-fil-a you know so, yeah yeah we, we stood out a little bit <laughs> yeah a little bit a little bit right so yeah like i i want to sit here and say like were there other people in there and i know that there yeah. were and i know that 
uh, let, let me reframe it. after a while did it just become normal i mean did yeah. it, they just like yeah that was like the, kind of the weird thing i mean you know people would look every now and again yeah. if they were doing something big but like you know i was like oh yeah it's those weird assholes in the corner yeah you know lifting weight again you know, everybody was like well i'm trying to get shredded and those guys are getting bigger and, and rounder yeah you know but yeah, yeah. And then, you know like well you know, every now and again we get questions like what like why what's that shirt why can't you put your arms down yeah i was like well you know that's how i lift that you yeah. know and yeah. and you you built solid numbers you yeah. know so mm -hmm. it's i took my glasses off but yeah. the and then and the 275s your total was how much uh i think my best was 2080 or yeah, 2080 yeah. and then 308 so that was the best combined out of whatever the classes yeah. were i mean so it's a, it's a respectable total then you know for <laughs> nice. multiply gear yeah. well gear changes yeah. right so there's it's it's weird how we got to contextualize know, right? the lifts now <laughs> like well that was back before the bench shirts were given yeah. the carryover that they do now and it was yeah. more learning the shirt was more yeah. of the issue than anything else and yeah there is an interesting story so now again so now you're yeah. in this community training center yeah <laughs> and you have I, it just hit me that these were these were the stupid bench shirts that never touched yeah. in and if you missed it was going to take your head off yeah it was a close that, collar that, too that had, to, that had to draw a crowd <laughs> a little bit and like i said i mean we were fortunate that like the staff would be there so people yeah. maybe they just thought like okay at least like leave the cattle alone yeah like yeah. <laughs> somebody of authority is here to like yeah. kind of watch um you know you get like the random guy now and again for like a side spot and you just gotta be like listen man like don't touch it mm -hmm. unless i'm dying you know because then i'm gonna die if you touch it you know on one side not the other um so yeah it was <laughs> i mean it was a spectacle a little bit so do you get yeah <laughs> I know multi-fly, right? Because I grew up around that. Yeah. So when you put your suit on, do you have to like go to the locker room where you just drop yeah, a trowel was, in the middle of the room like you well, do that in a was normal drip? Definitely kind of a bummer about the whole thing. Because yeah, <laughs> you'd have to like go to the bathroom. Because you know, yeah, it's like a normal gym otherwise. Yeah. yeah. And get it, you know, like the so I had the the ace, you know, adjustable yeah, straps yeah. and all that stuff. Get it stuck to about my hips, and I waddle out and wrapped it around the bar. You know, kind of just working. You know, I mean, you know how that goes, but. That was probably more of what drew attention than the lift itself. Mm -hmm. People like didn't care about how much you could lift on there. It was just like, like what are you doing, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, yeah. this guy wearing a diaper or whatever. Yeah. Um, the bench shirt was a little bit easier. That we didn't care as much. You just mm -hmm. you know, take your shirt off real yeah. quick. But yeah, that was uh, that was pretty <laughs> pretty absurd. Yeah. Um, and that was actually that was part of why I wasn't able to do the briefs with the suit because it was already like too much, you know. Yeah. And like the workouts were, were getting pretty long, so to like put the stuff on and it just it wasn't necessarily safe as it was. Mm -hmm. So then it was like, all right, well I just got to max out whatever I can with just the suit and the knee wraps, and then hope for the best after that. So yeah, I mean I I'd like to think that I had a higher ceiling than what I was able to do. Like if I had been in a an actual powerlifting gym. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, it went pretty hard. Well, I mean the 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 takeaway is that yeah. You, for those people that are listening, you can make any situation work if yeah. you really want to. So, I mean, given the class load and all the stuff that you're doing, mm -hmm. it, it, it to me, it makes sense, right? Because, yeah. yeah, you could have, and some people will say, well, you could have drove two hours. No, you can't. you right. got too much other shit going on. Yeah. But I want to flip a story in here real quick because you just yeah. reminded me of this. One of my good friends who's no longer with us, Bob Youngs, was from Florida as well. Yeah. And I remember one time I went down, and it was when he was – just after well, he's from there, came to Westside, trained there for a while, then moved back to Florida. It yeah. was before he found in a place to train. Mm -hmm. And we go down and it's a squat day. And it's his squat day because I don't know why I'm there to help somebody to meet. It's whatever it's going to be. And we're in a commercial gym, right? Yeah. And he's doing his warm ups and all this other stuff. And he just drops trial, <laughs> you know, like, like you would in a, any powerlifting gym, right? Just yeah. drops straight to his underwear to start putting his briefs on. And that's. Uh, somebody from behind the counter like like what are you i mean it was like and we're like oh shit you know we th it was right. so normal <laughs> right it, but it yeah. was such the abnormal place to be able to do it and i'm like dude you're lucky you didn't get like arrested for this right. shit. <laughs> but it was so funny because none of us and there's probably five or six of us there at the time yeah even gave this a second thought right it's like you time to put your briefs on just drop trial take it yeah. and put it on and that that kind of reminded me of that whole thing but with why why did you decide or at what point did you decide med school oh that was uh that was early and it like i almost hesitate to admit it because it's stupid but when i was in sixth grade we did like a career fair like i was i was you know i liked school i thought i was doing okay 
Um, and they said, oh, you know, the average salary for a doctor is this. And I was like, yeah, that sounds nice. I'll do that. That was the impetus for the whole thing. I was like, yeah, I want to make a nice, nice living. <laughs> and thankfully, over the process of getting there, I found out that I really like it. Like, I can't imagine doing anything else. Yeah. You know, I, I took some classes in high school. Um, it was called Medical Careers. And I was like, great. I want to go into medical careers. That sounds fun. It was mostly geared towards like medical assistants and nurses come to find out because mm. it was like this is how you change a bed and this is how you do a bed bath and you know stuff like that but the advantage was that it got me into a hospital two hours a day for volunteer work so it helped build up the resume i got exposed to a bunch of stuff um and for better or worse you know kind of the you know like the way society is they're like oh you're you're a guy why don't you come watch surgery you know your female classmates are going to go change beds I was like, oh, I mean, that sucks for them, of course, yeah, and it's no, not yeah, right, yeah, but, like, yeah. I got to see surgeries, and I got mm -hmm. to help with stuff and do that. And so I was like, okay, this is cool. This is what I want to do. Um, one of the other things we got to do in that class, they showed us, like, a live feed of a knee replacement. And I was like, well, that's, I mean, that's incredible. I was like, that's what I want to do. I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon. So, you know, worked hard in school, went, you know, went to college, worked hard in college, got to med school, and it was, like, just a big kind of shock. You know, I was, I was fortunate that I could – get by without too much study skills too many study skills i guess um through college and stuff like that like i worked hard but you know i wasn't the guy that would cram four hours at you know overnight or anything i would just kind of yeah i think i got it and sort mm -hmm. of work my way through it well that shit doesn't fly when you get to med school because it's 40 hours a week you know some weeks you got eight tests in the same week and you got to be on it and mm -hmm. so it took me a little while to kind of find my footing um and so there was that part of it, you know, my grades weren't like, I wasn't a four point student in med school. I did fine. You know, I, I graduated, I'm licensed and boarded. <laughs> Don't worry. But, <laughs> you know, but it was like, once you get into how competitive some of these fields are, it's like, well, you know, there's, there's a reason for that. I mean, you want to have really the smartest people doing these things. So there was that part of it. And then the way that med school set up the first two years, you're in the classroom, take your first, second set of boards, and then you get out on rotations where you're hands on learning going through like you know you do a month in family medicine you do a month of internal medicine a month of surgery all that stuff my very first rotation was family medicine and that guy said promise me you won't do family medicine and i was like oh okay like all right you know i'm not sure what i'm gonna do now anyway the next month was anesthesia and they were like you know surgery's all right and i saw they're like on their feet all day and this is when powerlifting was really starting to become more and more serious for me so yeah. i was like that's gonna fuck up my squad then <laughs> i was like i can't eat all day I'm going to be exhausted to train. I was like, that's probably out. So I ruled that out. And then I was like, internal medicine was next. Internal medicine was all hospital, everything hospital. Mm -hmm. You don't know how long you're going to be in there. It could be 12 hours. It could be 14 hours. It could be six hours. It just depends on, as a resident and a student, it just depends on when your attending shows up and says, okay, let's go see the patients. And so that was super frustrating. And I was like, man, I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. You know, like I'm, I'm pretty dedicated. I, you know, I work hard. But I was like, this this sucks, you know, like this mm -hmm. isn't what I thought it was going to be. And I started like really looking hard at what can I do with, you know, two years of med school education. And it turns out there's not a lot because like my undergrad degree was uh, movement science, which I thought would make me more marketable. But like in hindsight, it's like, what do you do with that except for go to grad school? So mm -hmm. I was like, kind of stuck. I was like, I'll just push through and just keep going until I kind of until I have to make a decision. And then uh, my next rotation after two months of internal medicine was family medicine again. And it was like complete polar opposite of everything I had done. You know, it was like the nicest, nicest docs. They weren't stressed out. They were some of the professors for the, for the university. So they were like, yeah, this is great. You should do this. You know, there's a big push in osteopathic medicine for primary care because it's most in line, I think, with the philosophy of mind, body, spirit, more of a holistic approach. Um, so I was like, okay, yeah. And one of the docs even said, he's like, you know, I could go somewhere else. He's like, I got a good job. He's like, it's easy. I get to hang out with my family. He's like, it's not a bad deal. It's like, okay, that sounds right. Like I felt comfortable, mm -hmm. fit the lifestyle, I could still train, I could eat, you know? So I was like checking all my boxes and then everything was kind of smooth from there. So like it started off from like a selfish thing, yeah. but turned into, you know, I found my, my spot. And it's, it's funny cause like they say a lot of people that want to become orthos wind up being family docs and then vice versa. You know, you get, interesting. Yeah. So I mean, there's always going to be those people that are like super gung ho, like this is what I'm doing. And they're really militant about it. And, you know, more power to them. You want those people. But yeah, it, it wound up being a really good fit. Um, my favorite part of being in family medicine is getting to know people and like, you know, like the family part of family medicine. So 
you know, I'll treat kids, I'll treat their parents, I'll treat the, the grandparents, you know, all in the same family. And, you know, someone comes in, they're like, oh, so-and-so is doing this, and, you know, maybe they're depressed. And then it's like, okay, well, I'm going to talk to the wife. I'm like, what's going on? You know, I can actually mm -hmm. get that that other aspect of it. So I've been able to kind of to bring it back to the, the question, yeah. you know. So getting involved with family medicine specifically went really well with kind of the other things that I enjoyed. You know, I, I wanted to have that work-life balance. Um, I wanted to be able to have the opportunity to sit down with people and talk about the lifestyle stuff, you know, all too often. And I, and I know it happens and I've been guilty of it before, but you know, when you're, you have a visit, especially in a traditional clinic, you know, if you're booked for 20 minutes, 15 minutes, you're lucky if you get seven to eight, that's like mm -hmm. the industry average, yeah. um, with the actual doctor. And it's usually like, okay, you get like one thing to kind of address. Here's some pills. We'll see in a couple months. Oh, you had something else schedule. I got to go, you know? So this kind of gave me a chance to dive into that a little bit. And then as I started working through my different, you know, jobs and stuff, trying to find the right fit, you know, as far as commute and everything else, um, I wound up at my current place, which is kind of like a mix of it's, it's primary care, but it's a mix of like concierge and, um, I don't know. Yeah. Like concierge and like kind of specialty family practice in a way where it's built into the schedule where everybody gets 30 to 60 minutes. So, you know, you have the time to sit down get to know people, give all that good lifestyle advice and, you know, just be like, Hey man, listen, like we can throw pills at this. It's still a, mm -hmm. a valid option. It's probably still going to be part of the treatment plan. But if we do X, Y, and Z with your diet and your exercise, you know, don't just get on a treadmill forever, try weight training. You know, mm -hmm. maybe you'll like it. Maybe it'll actually do more for your blood sugar than, than getting on the treadmill. Cause especially my, my patient population Doing extra walking at the end of the day just isn't an option. There, what is that? <clears throat> so the the population that we have, it's close to, we have, and I think we're at nine different local labor unions outside Chicago or within the Chicagoland area. So we have, you know, plumbers, cement masons, electricians, you know, all kinds of different, you know, hardworking trades. And so these guys are working, you know, long hours to get up early. By the time they are, they're off, they've already basically exercised all day. Yeah. So then we get to tack more like, okay, what do we do with your diet? Because like the average tradesman, their their diet is coffee and cigarettes for breakfast, McDonald's and cigarettes for lunch, and then dinner is just like a free for all. So mm -hmm. trying to sort of steer that in a, in a healthier direction. And we start to see some people coming back now that we've been open a couple of years where it's like, all right, their blood pressure is better, their sugar is better, their weight's down. So like kind of getting to marry the, you know, the, the fitness world that I'm, that I like with yeah. like the, the normal day job kind of stuff. How receptive will you say, cause you, I mean, you got a different population yeah. because of the careers that they're doing. Mm -hmm. How receptive do you, would you say they are to the exercise and diet changes? Just a broad percentage, half the people, a quarter um, of the people. Maybe quarter. <laughs> quarter. That's not bad though, right? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the obesity rates oh, and all yeah. the other things, for you sure. know, a quarter is better than yeah. zero. Oh, for sure. And I definitely, I try to come at it from, I don't want to say like a soft perspective, um, more of like a, I think realistic and like, kind of like, let's, let's get your toe in the water first. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the basics of like, you know, if, if you have to eat McDonald's cause that's just what's available by the job, don't get the fries. You know, if you're getting a sandwich and a fry and a drink or two sandwiches, fry and a drink, like just drop one of those items and let's see where that goes. I'm like, okay, that doesn't sound too bad. Um, you know, same with like exercise. So, you know, try to get extra steps, take the stairs instead of taking the skip to the top floor. You know, if you can get away with it, if it's 20 floors, I don't expect these guys to do 20 flights of stairs before mm -hmm. they work all day. You know, it's just not realistic, but you know, I try to come at it from that approach to make it a little bit more kind of digestible, you know, no, no pun intended. Cause like, I think for a lot of these, you know, especially, and not just the trades and, you know, their families and everybody else, you know, like I said, BC is a really common problem. Um, it seems really daunting if you tell somebody like, Hey, you could stand to lose 50, maybe a hundred pounds. Yeah. Well, it's like, well, shit, you might as well be a thousand pounds at that point. Yeah. So it's like, well, let's start with aim for 10. And then once you get going with that, you get comfortable with that. Maybe we try 20 in the next time around. And, you know, thankfully I have the, the extra experience as a nutrition and, and weight training coach with Renaissance periodization, you know, plug, yep. plug, yep. plug, plug, right. Um, but no, I mean the, the reality is, I mean, I've, I've been able to work with, you know, hundreds of clients to go through this process. And it's it's like a very different group of people, you know, because you get people that come to RP, they're already involved in fitness, most of them. Or, mm -hmm. you know, they've already kind of started that process. They just need a little extra guidance. Or maybe they are just starting out. But either way, they're already in that, that thought process of like, okay, a change needs to happen. 
So I've gotten a lot of experience kind of learning where the, the pitfalls can be, you know, where do people trip up with their diet and their exercise when they're like really trying and where do they trip up when maybe it's not their first priority and things like that. So then I can kind of bring that and say, all right, how about we try a version of this for like the average person that just needs to drop a few, you mm -hmm. know, someone that's not looking to optimize in, you know, every aspect of it, you know, where they're not going to time their macros and all that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, trying to find that common ground and make it make it easier to kind of wrap their head around. So yeah, I want to keep going down that path. I definitely yeah. want to go down the other path of sure. the RP stuff, right? Because that's more interesting to me. But I mean, yeah. you're, you're saying a lot of things right now that I think, you know, the audience, it's going to resonate with them, not so much for their own training, but maybe mm -hmm. like their mom or their uncle yeah. or their dad, you know, people who are not training at all. Yeah. Um, and that, that's who you're seeing in the practice most yeah. of the time, right? What's what's the lowest hanging fruit, you mm -hmm. know, because to start with, like the McDonald's example, I get yeah. that, right? Is what are some of the other things? Because um, being somebody that's been in that position the whole life, you know, you'll yeah. have other people and I call them the painful conversations, right? <laughs> Especially if you're a lifter, yeah. you're at dinner somewhere. And like, oh, you lift weights. And then they start asking you like, oh, what do you do? What do you yeah. do? And you're looking at them. You're like, well, you know what you really need to do is to not. Right do this this and this but you're trying to figure out how to break it down to the easiest yeah simplest thing yeah. where what have you had the greatest luck with for that first start yeah no it's, it's a good point because i mean a lot of times it's you know there, there's so much information out there and people if they've looked at it all you know someone will come to me and be like well you know you shouldn't eat carbs everything will be okay yeah it's like, well, you know there's there's value in that but there's also value in Maybe you do eat some carbs, just try not to eat bad ones all the time, you know? So I, I always try to go from that perspective of, like, moderation, you know? Because I've, I've had to, like, when I first started practicing doing this kind of stuff specifically, I had to, like, kind of bite my tongue sometimes because, you know, you're, you're involved in this because you want to tell them, like, look, yeah. man, if you do all these things. Yeah, five meals a day, yeah. do this. They're like, not look, gonna, man, I'll yeah, tell you exactly yeah. how many macros, <laughs> and they're like, what's a macro, you know? Yeah. So it's, I usually try more from the, the, the standpoint of, like, okay, like, you probably have an idea of, like, you could look at, fast food versus a home cooked meal and be like, that's probably healthier to go with like the grilled chicken, you know? And so, you know, trying to do they though? I mean, sometimes <laughs> I actually question that some people, some people, not so much. I mean, there, yeah. there is still, you know, plenty of people that maybe don't have that full connection figured out. I remember actually my grandmother one time, she kind of got mad at me because I took the skin off my, my chicken leg. She's like, what's wrong with that? I'm like, Grant, you know, that's, that's all fat. She's like, no, it's not. It's skin. I was like, but grandma that's <laughs> like no and i'm thinking i was like oh, rest rest in peace it was like this is why grandpa was 300 pounds like mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so it's it but, is good though oh it's so <laughs> good. and let me tell you <laughs> yeah the the way up was always so much more fun oh, weight yeah. wise than it was on the way down yeah. but um yeah i think mostly just trying to find that common ground of like okay you know tell me what you know already and let's see you know how far off you are or maybe you're right on and just need to find a way to like stay motivated you know, mm -hmm. and I always try the, um, I say, listen, you know, nobody stays motivated all the time. It's just not realistic. So you want to get into like the habit side of things. So, you know, if you have a habit of every day you put your, your left sock on first, like that just happens automatically. So you don't have to think about it. You could be having the worst day of your life. You're still putting that left sock on first. So, you know, trying to find a way to make diet and exercise kind of in that same pattern, you know, say, all right, well, and I got this actually from, uh, Dr. Mel, one of the other RP coaches, but it's like, you start with literally the the minimal buy-in you can. You say, okay, I want to start exercising three days a week. Okay, well, three days a week, I want you to put on your workout clothes. Whether you go to the gym or not, you've accomplished your goal. You say, okay, that's easy, right? Next week, put on your clothes, go to your car. Okay, whether you go back inside or if you go to the gym, you're, you're good, you check your box. And eventually you work up to, okay, you get to the gym, maybe you're there 10 minutes, maybe you're there four hours. But as long as you got there, and you know, usually I think by like the second or third week, people are like, this is dumb, I'm already... Mm -hmm. I'm in it. I'm just going to do yeah. it. And then try to make that as, as just routine and automatic. So then it's like, okay, I've got all these other things that are stressful. You know, like I'm sure you've rearranged your life for training plenty Many of times. times. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Most of my um, life. Yeah. So it's like, no, this is the constant. Everything else is going to follow, you know, and, and hopefully for like the average person, that's just like, yeah, I just eat healthy. I'm someone who eats healthy. I'm not on a diet. I just eat healthy. You know, that's, that's my goal. If I can get them to be like, yeah, I, I just don't eat, you know, bullshit all the time. Mm -hmm. That would be ideal because that's going to save us a lot of trouble when it comes to, you know, diabetes and blood pressure and all this other stuff that's just rampant, you know. So that's really my focus is just trying to, like, slowly instill these healthy habits. And a lot of it for, for our population specifically is 
just getting to the doctor. Like we go to their events and their meetings and stuff just to be like, hey, you know, we're here. This is a service that we offer. Um, come to the doctor, just get checked out. Like I promise, if you yeah. come in and get checked out, yeah. we'll take care of the rest. And, you know, we've got, I don't remember the, like the, the scores that we get on whatever quality measures and like, you know, how, I don't remember the name of it, but like the percentage chance that somebody's going to come back or tell somebody nice, there's something nice about it. It's like 99% for our clinics. So it's like once they get there and they, they see all the stuff we do, we do all this counseling, they're likely to come back. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, great. Let's just start that minimal buy-in. Just get there. You know? Yeah. And, you know, each union's kind of incentivized it in their own way. Some people get, you know, 200 bucks in their health savings account or, you know, maybe they get a cheaper deductible or something like that. So it's like, you know, just get into the doctor, you know, just like with the, the Merrick Health thing. It's like mm-hmm. just get that blood work just to find out mm-hmm. instead of just – you know, because otherwise people don't show up until they're sick. Yeah, they're sick or they're broken, you know, and the the one guy always jokes. He says, you know, you don't stop working unless you get a bone sticking out of your arm. Like you just keep going mm-hmm. and to that point. Actually, it's actually kind of nice because like working with these guys, you have to like chain them down to keep them from going back to work, you know, versus other jobs I've had doing workers comp and stuff. People are like, yeah, I think I need another couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. These guys are like, no, nah, man, I need to go. Like, I'm leaving from here. It's like, well, buddy, you, you have a 104 fever. Like, let's let's mm-hmm. sit for a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that <clears throat> Dr. Mike was saying would be good conversation is mm-hmm. when looking through your numbers there, and you kind of said it a little bit earlier, it was hard for you to get to that 308, yeah. right? So I kind of had the same problem, Mike. So yeah. it's, you know, it's 275 and, you know, Louis wanted to, th- I wanted to be 308 for multiple reasons. My leverage was going to be better, but man, yeah. it was a bitch oh, to yeah. get the weight up, you know? So yeah. what, what strategies did you find helped to get yeah. over that base? And I don't mm-hmm. even want to say it's a baseline cause you're forcing it, but it right. kind of still is. Yeah. And then what are some of the things that didn't obviously didn't help? Um, well, I'm be honest with you, man. So I, I've been reading your stuff since I yeah. started with powerlifting. And so you, I've, I have it bookmarked on my computer, the story of how you gained weight with the chocolate bars and oh, McDonald's yeah. bread. Well, that was just a little bump. You know what I'm saying? That yeah. was not. But it, like, I kind of took that, that mindset yeah. to heart for a while. I mean, you know, I was, I was fortunate that I had a pretty good metabolism in the beginning. You know, yeah. like a lot of people, you're yeah. 18, you can do anything you want. Right. But I came into college at about 200 pounds. Um, like I came into high school at 165, I left at 200 because I just, you know, kind of ate and trained and just like everything kind of worked. And then once I got involved with powerlifting, I was like, okay, well, yeah, I got to get bigger, you know, and, and, you know, you and Mark Bartley and all these guys that were, you know, getting big and big and big. I was like, cool, I'm going to do that. So I, uh, I had access to the cafeteria. So I was eating cafeteria food, like most meals. Mm-hmm. And I just made a point of like, okay, whatever I would eat normally, which was already a pretty good amount, I'm going to have a second plate. And just doing that consistently, and like, but that still only gets you so. You see what I'm saying? That still right. only yeah, gets that you was so like far. 200 to 220, and then it was you know, making sure you take your protein powders and all that stuff, mm-hmm. and then it was like, well, you know, potatoes, ground beef, you know, rice, eggs, tuna, all that stuff was real cheap. Just hammering that down. I had a mm-hmm. buddy that worked at GNC, and he gave me expired weight gainer shakes, so mm-hmm. hammering those down. Mm-hmm. Um, started doing other shakes that were like. You know, a couple of scoops of protein, a couple of scoops of uh, oats, olive oil, just like, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, I like <laughs> to break it necessary. down and say it, it yeah. always comes down to like calories per bite and calories per gulp, you know, yeah. swallow. Like, how can you add more oh, yeah. calories? Yeah, it was just like really forcing it down, you know. And then the further I got in powerlifting, the more my cardio went down. Yes. Because it was like, that's just more calories I got to eat. Yes. And I remember talking to Israel, I was like, kind of asking him, like, how much do I need to do? He's like, it's a powerlifter, almost none. So, okay, in retrospect, it's something I recommend my clients mm-hmm. now and my patients for sure, but, like, maintaining some level of cardiovascular fitness is incredibly important, especially when you're pushing your body weight mm-hmm. because then you keep your blood pressure under control and you can dodge a lot of, like, potential adverse effects. So, yes, and it increases yeah. your appetite. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that was, that's actually that's a really I good mean, point, that, too. that was the one thing that I found. It didn't take a lot. Yeah. You know, sled dragging or just – 10 minutes on a treadmill it wasn't it wasn't a few times it wasn't a lot but if i didn't do it Mm -hmm. eating was already work yeah (laughs) if i didn't do it it made it like overtime work yeah where if i did it it 
I could get, I could eat more. I mean, there's still yeah. multiple times I'm sure you can relate to where you're, you eat so much in a quadruped position on your bed, just yeah. hoping your stomach will stretch out. Right. <laughs> you know, like, can, will it actually hit the bed this time? It's like, oh my God, <laughs> you lay on your side and that doesn't help. You're just trying to find relief, yeah. you know, and that's just probably not the best strategy. No. I always know. had the, the philosophy of just, you know, when I thought like, okay, I need to get healthier. I say always add, never subtract which in retrospect, again, was like a terrible idea, but I'd be like, okay, I'm already eating as much chicken as I really care to eat. I'm having as many peanut butter and jelly sandwiches as I care to eat. I was like, I'm going to start eating burritos on top of that. Yeah. And then I started making, uh, I called it egg mash where you go to Publix. Cause I was living in Florida at the time and get these, uh, they sold like a 10 pack of hash browns. And so I throw two or three of those in a pan. I'd fry up like eight eggs and just mash it all together and be mm -hmm. like, I'm gonna be healthy. And I throw a handful of spinach on top. Of yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Mix all that up, and I would eat that every night at about 10 o'clock, mm -hmm. and then i go to bed. And so that was, like, one of the big, you know, 260 to 270 kind of moments. Um, I think the other thing, too, was the difference between college and, and like, med school when I made my other big weight changes. Um, in college, everything was walking distance. You know, everything was 20 minutes, so my car was parked most of the year. True. And then, and you know, to be that guy. It was uphill in the snow. It was in No, yeah, I mean, yeah. no, no, I know I get it. No, I get <laughs> yeah. it, yeah. But then, like, in Florida, I had to drive everywhere. It's too hot to do cardio outside, so mm -hmm. I was like, well, screw it. And I'll just, you know, sit in the library and eat. And, you know, I was the guy in class that was, like, hammering down food. And, mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. like, well, it makes it easier because yeah. you're there's there's less steps, right? Yeah. Where I didn't put one and one together until you just said that. When I was yeah. in college, I mean, it was, I was walking everywhere. Yeah. You know, because even if I could have drove, it's mm -hmm. a pain in the ass because you oh, got to yeah, park and you're still nightmare. walking. It's just a pain in the ass. So you're yeah. walking all over the place mm -hmm. wondering why the hell can I get over 260? Well, right. that <laughs> makes sense now, you know, when you look yeah. back on the whole thing, you're in a, you're in a unique position now though, because you, you kind of came through with that same mindset, you know, and I think that same mindset still exists today. I'm not going to act like it doesn't exist. It mm -hmm. does. Um, and now you're on the other side of that, yeah. you know, so you can look back and say, you know, if I was to do that again, mm -hmm. I, I hate the question. Like if you were to do it over, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't like that question, but I always end up asking it anyhow, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm, I frame it a little bit differently because usually my answer to stuff like that would be, I was ignorant. I didn't know any different. Right. I did the best that I could did at the time. So I can't regret doing the best that I knew at yeah, the time. hundred percent. But if somebody else is doing that now, yeah. that's on the same trajectory and path that I was, I would suggest they do this. Yeah. What would be the suggestion that you would have? The biggest thing, probably the cardiovascular thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously, you, you want to push your weight. You know, if you are trying to get bigger, you want to push it with as much healthy food as you can get away with. But at some point, yeah. you're going to have to get junky if if you really want to push it, you know? And I guess the other thing, too, would be Let's to restate that because I don't think people really <laughs> understand that. Because even when yeah. I was doing all that other crap that you're talking about, yeah. that base still existed. Yeah. Right. So right. I want to say chicken like, and rice and the, yeah, I want to say yeah. like three times, like, like yeah. the, the healthy base <laughs> has to be there. Yeah. Cause the way I looked at that was that's, what's helping me recover. Yeah. That's what's helping me build muscle. Oh, yeah. The other crap is helping me like retain water, yeah. gain weight and get fat. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't have that and it's not a big base, mm -hmm. you know, but go right. ahead, continue. I just want yeah, to make no, sure I said that a, three times cause people yeah. don't get it for sure. And that, that is a really good point. Cause I mean, you can only get, you know, to a point only so many grams of protein from like burgers and stuff before most of that, you know, your ratio of, of protein to fat, it just gets astronomical. Mm -hmm. You probably like peter out before you get enough protein from a really junky meal like that. So, yeah, I mean, you absolutely you have to have the, the healthy food as the foundation for all of it. So to, to answer your question for someone else or mm -hmm. even for myself, again, probably to keep more of my diet healthy because I didn't have as much of like the good foundation. Mm -hmm. It was more. You know, because I, like I, I could get away with it for so long that I was like, if there's protein in this meal, I can say it's fine. Mm -hmm. Like just as a general statement. And I always looked at it as this is for my sport. And if my shirt fits tighter, if my squat suit's tighter, it's all good. Mm -hmm. You know, the weight goes up and everybody's happy. Um, the other big thing would be going to the doctor. I mean, not just because I'm biased, but like going to the doctor because... I kind of blew off like low, low level hypertension for a little while. You know, I was sitting at like probably one thirties, one forties for like a couple of years. And you justify it, right? Yeah, it's like for it's, sure. It's not high, right. but it's, it's not it's scary. High. High. Yeah. 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 I was yeah. like, you know, I don't have any vision changes. I'm all right. You yeah. know? And every time I went to the doctor for like routine stuff, they'd be like, well, you know, you're young. It's fine. You're probably just nervous. I was like, you got it. Mm -hmm. Probably just nervous. And I just blew it off. And now, you know, 
I'm on blood pressure pills. I have something called dilated cardiomyopathy, which is your heart stretches out from, you know, prolonged pressure and stuff, whether it's just from that low grade hypertension, is it genetic? Is it from the lifting? Who knows? It's probably all of it, mm -hmm. but you want to do everything you can to kind of mitigate your risk. Right? So if I could do it again, I would have made sure my blood pressure stayed under control. I would have increased my cardio for sure. Um, I don't know. I mean, I liked being bigger, you know, I like being stronger, obviously. So I don't want to say necessarily that I wouldn't have pushed to 275, you know, 295 around there to be in the three weight class. Um, right now I'm sitting in like the mid 240s and I feel okay, you know, better than I did. It's like maybe I could have stayed in the 240s and just like gotten better at 240. Hard to say. Kind of to your point, like I, I did what I had. Yeah. I did what I did with what I knew. And, you know, I, I can't say I regret it even, even with the health stuff because, you know, it helped me get this lifestyle that I like. You know, I like coaching. I like being involved in, in powerlifting. I like having everything that I have. I'm very fortunate for all that. So, like, to say, like, okay, if I hadn't gone as far with powerlifting as I did, you know, would I have been as as qualified to be, like, a coach? Is there a difference in the so the blood pressure medications mm -hmm. today than, say, I'm trying to go back, say, 15 years ago? Cause oh, yeah. when my my pushback on that was it's the same thing you know it's always this not really high but high like yeah. that low that that oh you're good you just don't want it to get worse than this yeah for sure that area and then if it was the blood pressure meds everybody that i knew or the 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 rumor i can't say for sure because i've been going back a long time yeah don't take those because they sap your strength right and so it's like fuck that i'm never going to take those no matter right. how high where it seems today that it am I, is it fair to say that's yeah. probably not the case. Probably not. You know, and and it's interesting because I've had patients come in that you know they don't lift or anything, but they yeah. have physical jobs. So it's like, you know, I've had guys come in, they have no idea. The blood pressure, literally, I've I've the highest I've seen was like 190, systolic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can't let you leave, man. It's like either yeah. I send you to the hospital or you take these pills right now. Mm -hmm. And so they take them, they hang out, it goes down. They come back like a week later, they're like, you know, I'm not anxious anymore. I'm like were you anxious before? He's like, I didn't know that I was. And now I ain't like, now I know mm -hmm. that I'm not. And they feel better when they're moving around at work. You know, other guys are like, I sleep better and all this other stuff. So I wonder how much of that thought was more just like, when you take that, like anxious, like I'm going to pop, you know, like mm -hmm. when you first get your suit on kind of thing. Yeah. When you take that away, it's like, okay, maybe, maybe that's why it feels like you're maybe not yeah, as strong yeah, yeah. just cause you don't like, you don't have your edge. Um, I can tell you now being on the other side of it, like, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not as strong for a number of reasons, but even still, it's like, I feel way better. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah. I'll let you expand on this. Blood, high blood pressure is no joke. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, we being 20, yep, yeah. maybe probably, I mean, age matters, right? Oh, I for mean, sure. you, you can do more stupid shit when you're younger, yeah. but that's not saying that it's smart and it's developing good habits. Yeah. I don't even want to say you should do stupid shit when you're younger anymore. Yeah. But... <clears throat> It was, I kind of always looked at it as, eh, whatever. It's like, it's not a big yeah. deal. It's a big fucking deal. Yeah. I mean, it's oh, yeah. killing people. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially, you know, because it was like the whole thing. When I first found out about this cardiomyopathy, I mean, I was, I don't know, 28, 29. And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? I don't have heart failure. Like, yes. there's no way. I'm like, I've been working out, you know, like for, probably from the time that I was, I guess if you include sports, from the time I was like 13 or 12. I don't think I've gone more than 10 days without working out. And I was like, what do you mean I have a heart condition? You know, I've got like problems when I, I'm fit, you know, I sort of kept a healthy-ish weight, you know, all that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, I don't eat great, but like I didn't smoke, especially in like, you know, med school. I wasn't like drinking or anything because I didn't have time for all that. You know, I wasn't like, you know, doing cocaine or anything like that. I was like, this, this doesn't make sense. It's not fair. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I know plenty of guys out there doing far worse things and they're fine. Mm -hmm. you assume they're fine they're still walking around so like to that point you know the blood pressure thing if if you don't keep an eye on it that's something that can sneak up on you you know that they call it the silent killer for a reason because like you don't feel it until you feel it you know i mean maybe it's ah, you know sometimes i get headaches if, if you're getting headaches that's usually it's pretty, pretty high yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like i said like that one guy he told me he wasn't anxious anymore probably just thought like that's life you know who isn't anxious sometimes and then you know other stuff is like 
it just happens you know all of a sudden you know you know there's no predicting the future mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. sometimes it happens when we're on the road sometimes it just happens and mm -hmm. it's, it's terrible so you want to do everything you can to kind of reduce your risk without you know you don't want to be like stuck inside shivering under a blanket all the time mm -hmm. but like still you know, it's like get some steps in get get some healthy food in you know maybe not too much salt you know it's like we have so much stuff just readily available you know i mean we've got food that's like manufactured to be as, as tasty as possible you know it's a bunch mm -hmm. of salt it's so good it's cheap you know caffeine i mean i, I suck down you know energy mm -hmm. drinks and coffee all day and it's like that's probably not great mm -hmm. for my situation but yeah <laughs> like i know everything's I was just gonna... it's all just like right there mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's hard to say no i don't want it when it's just it's just right there yeah well that's what i was going to ask is you <laughs> yeah. know you're you're in a weird position because you're a doctor yeah and you know what your doctor would say and you know what you would say right so you're in this really <laughs> weird circle yeah. right where you're like doing some things that are probably to the best advice and you're doing yeah. some things that you know aren't to the best advice and you got to yeah. mitigate that it's a risk yeah. balance risk oh, absolutely risk assessment yeah. right so not for the people that are listening but for yourself yeah. like how mm -hmm. are you balancing that with your own training and say the, yeah. the drinks and stuff like that right and actually i should preface all of this I, I meant to say at the beginning you know everything i say regarding medical stuff is not individual medical advice and you know shouldn't be construed as yes, such if yes. anybody has any concerns consult your own physician 100 percent. Yeah. um yeah you know you, there's good days and bad days right i mean there's days where i eat like a complete asshole and you know if i'm tired i'm gonna have you know the equivalent of like five cups of coffee six cups of coffee because i gotta stay awake i got stuff to do you know i, I got two jobs i got kids all that stuff right um I'd like to think that these days I'm a lot more conscious of it. And like, I go for a walk every day on my lunch break, you know, that, that was a big part of me getting in better shape now that I've kind of come back down the other side of it. Um, I eat out way less when I do eat out. It's, it's typically healthier. There's like a, a market down the street from my job. So like I walk there, I get from the salad bar. It's like, they have, I don't know, some kind of beef, they've got chicken, they've got shrimp. And I just load up like the salad bar container with that. And then I walk back. And so it's like, that instead of what I used to do, where I get a couple sub sandwiches, or I get, you know, I go to Burger King, or I go, you know, the diner, the other direction, the diner was fantastic, but still like trying to make those healthier choices here and there. And then, you know, I'm, I cut a lot of weight. That was a big thing. You know, I walk around, like I said, I walk around now like mid 240s instead of before when I was still competing in powerlifting, where I was like consistently in the 270s on the low end. So I think that helps um, as far as like balancing. Mm -hmm. I can't see myself giving up lifting anytime soon. I know there's still health benefits of lifting, mm -hmm. probably less so from lifting heavy. So I, you know, maybe four months of the year now, I get into like an actual strength block where Got I'll it. try and hit some like double, like today, yeah. you know, and that compared to what used to be a strength block is a big difference too. I mean, some mm -hmm. of that's just because that's what I can do now. And some of that's like by design, right? Yeah, I, I yeah, can't yeah, be, yeah. Can't be pushing the envelope as much. Um, so that's, that's probably the biggest thing of, of, and each year that goes by, I mean, it sounds like kind of sappy, but like, as I mature and like kind of come to terms with, with aging and, you know, I'm, I'm not 25 anymore at the peak of my game. It's like, there's the risk isn't worth it to, to do all that. It's like, yeah, it'd be a lot of fun to get back to 275 and like be as strong as yeah. I can and all that sort of thing. But if I croak at 50, you know what does that do for my kids <laughs> yeah i mean you're going to like all, yeah. <laughs> I mean, all your training you're going to reassess on an annual at least yeah. i think you should everybody should reassess on an annual basis if yeah. not longer it's like here's what this periodization is going to look like for the next year and yeah. then if you want to have that strength block the strength block is in there mm -hmm. then where are the other blocks and then you you take that information that what you kind of want to do yeah then you look at your blood work and you look at your physical and you, you got to have people around you yeah you know to be able to i call them enablers and realists right yeah you need to have the enablers gonna be like yeah that's yeah, the stupid shit right yeah. then you gotta have the other voice in your ear that's like eh, that's kind of stupid shit yeah and then you find your way yeah you know and i think that's just that's kind of how i've mitigated right. doing my stupid shit oh for you know, sure as i get older you get, i'm not it's not gonna go away right but i can do it more intelligently yeah exactly stupid it's it's uh intelligently. <laughs> it's tame <laughs> yeah, yeah you gotta you gotta tame it just a little bit yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm with you man it's yeah. like and we talked about this before but like i most of the time i've i've come to terms with the fact that like okay this is just what training is be grateful you can train in general right i mean you can you, can you still, get greedy 
Exactly. <laughs> start feeling good because you're, you know, you're doing the right thing. So mm-hmm. it starts to feel good. And that's like, maybe I could do the wrong thing a little bit. And it's usually a pretty quick reminder. So like, you know, my knees start to hurt. It's like, well, okay, I guess we back off again, you know, instead mm-hmm. of putting, cause it's not like I got a competition coming up, you know? So it's not like I have to just kind of like gut it out for 16 weeks and then we can back. It's just like, well, I'm just in the back off part now. Like, it's not to say I don't train hard, but I just don't train hard in the same way that's damaging. Yeah. You know, I can find other ways to make it challenging, you know? So there's that. And like trying to shift what the goals are, trying to find, I don't know if purpose is the right word, but like trying to find the, the motivating factor in a new goal. So, Mm -hmm. you know, something that my friends and I did. So I mentioned, you know, Mark before, so he's also, he was a great powerlifter. He's kind of on the other side of his powerlifting now where just trying to stay in shape and, and be strong in other ways. Um, and our other friend that we used to train with down in Florida, Mike Massey, he's a physical therapist. He's fantastic. He does, you know, he's helped us both out with various injuries and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, we just, we got a group chat going. It's like, all right, well, what can we do to, to be competitive with each other? That's not going to hurt ourselves. So we recently did part of like my, my weight loss recently, we did uh, like a fake NFL combine. So we did like 225 for reps. We did 40 yard sprints and, you know, a hundred yard dash. And we looked at like, okay, should we do a shuttle run? It was unanimous, like, no, we're, we're going to blow something out. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, like, finding those ways to still, you know, it's just, just the right amount of stupid that keeps it fun mm-hmm. without, like, you know, being dangerously stupid. So, yeah, I mean, that's it's, it's that whole thing on, like, Facebook memes. Like, you know, every, every man's got two wolves inside of him. It's like yeah. trying to find the one that's more sensible these days. Yeah. The way that, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the wolves is the, the funny. The, the way that I think of it is, you know, the scene from Animal House where you got the angel and the yeah. devil and it's, you know, it's, <laughs> and going back and forth. And I, I personally, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, I do because I think that that's, it makes you a better doctor. It's going to mm-hmm. make you a better coach with Renaissance periodization, especially yeah. probably more so there than is the doctor, right? right? Because you're dealing with, people that are more training is more of a priority yeah. actually it's it, if they're paying for you as a coach to be able to right. help them with their training their nutrition it's it's a top three priority oh for sure or yeah. they're not paying you know they're just yeah. not going to do that whereas if you don't have those conflicting voices in your own head then you're not going to be able to relate to those people yeah. because they do oh absolutely and actually they're biased to warn one of those voices which yeah. is the, the more the enabler yeah pushing one there Mm-hmm. So with with those people, because now we're talking about a different population, yeah. um, what are you finding with those clients there that are the, um, I don't want to say biggest mistakes, the biggest, um, the biggest things they overlook? Yeah, probably uh, preparation. You so know, how so? Like with nutrition, nutrition is always like the hardest part, you know, yes. like it's really cool because I can take people that don't have like a powerlifting background and, you know, I am inherently biased towards powerlifting. So like a lot of my training that I write for people is geared with like big compound movements and, you know, you get people that have no experience with it. They're like, Hey, this is a lot of fun. Like I'm getting stronger, even though we're doing like hypertrophy work. They're like, you know, this is great. Cool. That part's easy. Everybody's really consistent with that. They show up, they do the work, all that. But the nutrition part is always the hardest because, you know, that's that's the the moment to moment. You know, you can you can block off an hour and a half to go train and you can really give it your all. But those other, you know, 10 hours of the day that you're awake or 12 hours that you're awake, that's where like the nutrition really starts to get challenging because Mm -hmm. everything else in life, excuse me, happens during that time. Work stress, life stress, you know, kids get sick, whatever. And, you know, so the big thing I try to drive home is like prepare as much as possible whether that's Sunday meal prep or getting a meal service or something. So then when the shit hits the fan, you have something, you know, instead of like, ah, whatever, I'm just going to grab whatever's convenient. Make sure that convenient thing is healthy because otherwise it's going to be the burger. It's going to be something that doesn't fit. And then there's frustration with, you know, I'm starving. I don't make people starve. I want to make that clear too. It's a, it's a very moderate, like sensible approach, but like, you know, at some point in a diet, like you're hungry Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's, that's when the motivation drops. Cause it's like, you know, is, is this working? Is it not working? I, I'm just, I just want to eat something. It's like, well, just have that, have that healthy food ready because when it gets hard, you, you want to eliminate as many steps to healthy as you can. You know, if it's mm-hmm. like, all right, well, I'm going to Burger King cause it's right there. Well, yeah, you're not going to make as much progress. So preparation's huge. Um, being comfortable with the consistency part of it. Cause that's the other thing too. Sometimes people are like really good Monday through Friday. 
and then the weekends are just totally off the rails. So that's one where I can definitely relate because every time I diet, that's what happens. And <laughs> trying to find like, okay, if I can, well, you, it, you know, your routine your routine gets taken away on the weekend. Yeah. You know, yeah, so exactly. Here, yeah, you yeah. lose the the you know the the hourly schedule mm-hmm, and stuff like mm-hmm. that. You know, versus like my work day, I eat before work. I've got my lunch time. I have a protein bar at two o'clock, and then I eat when I get home. But yeah, Saturdays just you know figure it out. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so being being ready for all that stuff. I mean, I've even had people like set timers on their phone, you know, or be like, hey, just pick a task every couple hours on Saturday, whether it's like you know walk to the kitchen, just something stupid, so it like reminds you like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to eat at this time mm-hmm. and then you know if there's like a party because there's always like a party you know and as we get into the holiday season this is when a lot of people struggle because like you know i've, I've got a, a batch of clients right now that you know maybe they're coming off their their three-month cut phase and we just had halloween now we're hitting thanksgiving and then christmas and it's like those are those are big food holidays mm-hmm. so you want to be like all right man let's set the expectation of you're going to be really on top of your diet be really consistent you don't have to be perfect. You know, you don't have to measure every single gram. I mean, it works better when you do, but you know, just if you're good, like, you know, Monday or, you know, Sunday through Wednesday of Thanksgiving, then eat whatever you want on Thanksgiving and then, you know, get right back on it Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then for the next you know month until Christmas, that way you don't have to feel as deprived and you can still get most of the benefit. You know, you don't have to worry about like, Oh, I, I can't hang out with my family because you know, I got to eat my chicken and rice. Yeah. It's like, well, no, man. Like, there's more important things in life than traveling. The, the holidays was one thing when when I was gaining weight and still competing. It, yeah. It, it, it's getting, I understand it now, but it confused mm-hmm. me so much because I always lost weight, right? And yeah. I lost weight because <laughs> I'm not eating all day. Yeah. It's like now, say Thanksgiving, for instance, you pound one huge meal, then you're fucking, you're zapped for like yeah. five hours. Oh, absolutely. Then you eat the other one. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I know by the end of the day, the number of calories I pulled in during that day was right. lower <laughs> than if I was eating the meals as in the yeah. shakes and all the other crap that I was doing. Yeah. So it's like, like what? Yeah. And it's like, come on, man! It's it's this like turkey and rice. I mean, this is like just crap food. You know, if yeah. I'm, I want to eat the cake and shit like right. that. You know, <laughs> it, was, it it was a weird one for me until until I got older. Right, yeah. I realized that most people aren't pounding eight thousand right. calories a day. <laughs> you know, yeah. and stuff like that. Whereas they, and then I also realized, and this was when I was working as a personal trainer, it's not just those days, right? It's the office party and the stuff that people bring into the office that all gets compounded exponentially during those times. So like, here's donuts this day. And that's a really tough part with, uh, you know, clients alike, but you know, I mean, we're, we're very fortunate. We've got fantastic patients and, you know, really friendly people that come to see us. So it's like, Every holiday, you know, we get like a couple of plates of food, you know, brownies and, you know, oh, you know, thank you guys. And they, they bring us something. It's like, man, you know, you don't want to be rude, of course. Mm-hmm. And you want to enjoy it because it tastes good, you know. And then it's like, well, you know, there goes the diet day again. And that's the other actually kind of an important point with the diet thing is like not letting a cheap meal turn into a cheap day, weekend, week, month, 10 years kind mm-hmm. of thing. You know, because I've had some, you know, they, they get discouraged. It's, oh, you know, I, I, I screwed up and then I just said screw it for the rest of the night and I ate a whole pizza. It's like, mm-hmm. well, it's okay. These things happen. It's not ideal, but it happens. Just get back on track. Because if you let that one day become, well, now it's all, it doesn't matter anymore. And then all of a sudden the whole thing is shot. It's like, well, you know, just keep your eye on the big picture. You know, there's, there's more than just day to day. There's, there's the whole thing, you know, and then kind of on that same line, you know, as long as it doesn't become like an all the time thing, then it's all right. You know, I mean, people run into trouble sometimes when they do that, like weekend binge, you know, starve during the week, weekend binge thing. Um, because like your average for the week gets thrown off, but like the one off here and there is really not that big a deal. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's it you don't want to be like kind of kid gloves with people, but at the same time, it's like man, just cut yourself a break. You know, you're a human being. You, know, you get dinner with your family. Oh no, you know, you're an ass. No, you're not an ass. You had dinner with your family. It's not a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> just do it and then move on. So, with with the clients that you have. Mm-hmm. Tell me about a time because you've been doing this for a while with Renaissance yeah. Periodization. How long was it? Several years. 2016, I think. 2016, so yeah, yeah six, six, seven, almost seven years. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's there's a lot of clients, right, that mm-hmm. you've gone through. Tell me about a time where a client did something that was dumb enough to remind you of one of the dumbest things that you did. <laughs> um, 
dumbest things that I've done? Yeah, so that you know, the client does it, and oh. then they hit you like, oh, I remember when I did, and this is stupid as hell. It's, un- well, yeah, thankfully it's not super common, but it's like the, I feel good, I'm going to max out. That's that's usually the thing that kind of comes up. Because, like, again, you get people that are, like, really excited that they're making progress. Mm-hmm. And it happened recently, and, and the guy is super strong. And, like, it was interesting because it's not even that dumb. It's just more like, hey, this isn't the time for it. Um, but we were doing, you know, like, sets of 10 to 15 and during the deload week he like felt good and and mind you this was like getting back from some time away from lifting in general so it was Mm -hmm. like we're you know mid threes sets of 10 to 12 15 around you're already transitioning away from a break more or less yeah so you know he was like felt good man so i hit a single 530 just like you know no belt no wraps it's like Mm-hmm. Okay, well, well, at least I now, well, hey, yeah, you're, you're a lot stronger than we thought, so we can bump up all the weights, which is actually kind of a cool thing, but I was like, just just try not to do that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I was always, I was kind of notorious for that, where it was like, okay, we're going to do a volume block, and it'd be like two days, and they'd be like, all right, well, I, I got to see where I'm at now, and then mm-hmm. like, go too heavy, or, you know, right after a meet, like, well, I missed that bench in competition, eh, I'm going to take another run at it in competition, or, you know, in the gym yes. the next week, it's like, fucking terrible idea <laughs> it's, it's terrible i mean I, i've seen that one a lot right yeah. and that's where i learned pretty pretty soon after competing that 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 four weeks post competing is yeah. the most vulnerable time oh, yeah. for bad shit to happen <laughs> you know and it's when be pre west side i just took that whole month off i'm like yeah. i know the best way to avoid this right just <laughs> don't train yeah. at all just stay away from the gym yeah. And that's avoid those enablers, best. right? Yeah, that's not the best way. And then, yeah. you know, when it was, you know, while at West Side, it's like, okay, how do we, you know, avoid mm-hmm. this shit? You yeah. know, because there's other things that were shifting but for me personally at the time, hormones are changing, right. right? So there's there's all these whack things. Yeah. You know, stimulus is changing, you super compensated, you peaked, and hormones, I mean, oh, yeah. there's, there's internally it's a mess going on oh, if you yeah. really think about it. Right. And it's gonna Even take like emotionally, man. Like I was oh, always yeah. like I, it was it was weird, you know. I'd, I'd have like a great meet, and then I go to the gym the next week and just be like down. Like what the, like what happened, mm-hmm. man? Like I just I did what I wanted to. I was like, why did I just, I'm like sad, and I don't oh, even no. know why. It sucks everything yeah. out of you. Yeah, yeah, you it, know, it, it, yeah. You like deplete whatever you know your serotonin and dopamine, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And just like all right, well, it's time to rebuild that up too, yeah. I guess. <laughs> I kind of equate it to the. Once I took Adderall, right, and, yeah. and like made me really smart for a day, but then I was an idiot for three days afterwards, <laughs> you know, and, and it was kind of like, well, did I get as much done in that one day? I was really right, smart. Right, didn't make up for it. Because I was really stupid the three days. <laughs> it's it's kind of it's, it's like a meat, right? So yeah. you do a meat, and you're like, wow, it's, well, it could be bad, too. Yeah. It's like everything peaks, and then it's like, man, like what happened the whole month, yeah. you know, afterwards? Like, shit, I don't even want to be here. Yeah, it's the whole, but it's part of it, right? You know, yeah, it's kind of the ebb and flow of, of competition in general. Yeah. yeah, it's like you know, like day after a football game, you're like you know, beat up and tired. It's like, yeah, we won, that's cool, but I'm just kind of tired. Yeah, you know? mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like maybe I didn't enjoy it. I don't know, but yeah. On the on the other side, mm-hmm. with with that same reference, what are because because that's more of the funnier things. What what are some of the things that you see with your client clients not patients yeah. clients right so we're i'm making a strong distinction here yeah. like <clears throat> some of these like warning signs that you're seeing mm-hmm. because you're you're also a doctor so you're yeah. seeing these things mm-hmm. what are the most common warning signs that you're seeing pretty quick um as you can be an online because there's some right certain yeah so, uh, most of our like 99 percent of our communications via email yeah, and, like, yeah. videos and stuff um i've had a couple women where they're you know like their cycle stopped and it's like hey we gotta we gotta stop Mm-hmm. Like you got to go see your doctor because that's potentially a big red flag. You know, if mm-hmm. our fats are too low and, you know, they're, they're hardworking, they're dedicated. They're like, no, this is fine. I can keep doing this. It's like, no, nah, this is really getting into dangerous territory. If like your normal hormonal function is thrown off, your bone density is going to go down. Like we're just asking for trouble. They're like got to stop. Go see your doctor. So that's come up a couple of times. Thankfully, not too much. You know, and you know, as experience comes to, you know, I. I don't think I ever really dropped anybody below like 30 grams of, of fat a day, but even that, I mean, that's, that's pretty low. Mm-hmm. Um, but I keep fats a little bit higher now and manipulate some other stuff. So it's, it's a little bit different, but I'd say it's warning signs in terms of success and what's just not going to be successful. Or just globally. Yeah. I'd say the kind of like the consistency thing, but them not telling me until it's already like way far into it. So like we start with a base diet and say, these are all your macros. I, I tend to aim like a little bit high, 
So then they're like, man, I'm stuffed. It's like, great. We can make reductions now. Your weight's okay. So like we can make reductions. You're going to see some progress. Um, but sometimes people just don't communicate. And then all of a sudden we're on, you know, week nine and looking at their, their spreadsheet, you know, they're on 30 grams of fat and they've got like 80 grams of carbs for the day. And they're like, yeah, my weight's not moving. It's like, well, something's wrong. It's like, you got to see a doctor, see if your thyroid's okay, see if your hormones are fine, all that stuff. And then, you know, and, there, and I always, I try to say like, you know, how's it going? How, you know, are you meeting your goals? Are you meeting your macros? Have you, you know, any deviations from the plan? And sometimes they swear up and down, oh yeah, everything's fine. But then that like week nine or 10, they're like, well, actually, you know, I've been doing X, Y, and Z every week. It's like, well, why don't you tell me that? I wouldn't have dropped you so low if I knew that you were eating, you know, 80 grams of carbs on the side. It's like, well, it, you know, the markers I gave you aren't representative of what's going on. So it's like, well, now we need to back all the way up until we get to a point where you're following that consistently. Mm -hmm. So I've had other clients too where, you know, we diet them way down and, you know, the same thing, you, know, you kind of find out after the fact that there was like, you know, some laxity along the way. And it's like, well, I haven't looked at my spreadsheet in, in like a month. It's like, well, it's kind of hard to know if it's working or not if we're not tracking it that way. And so we'll do like, all right, send me a food journal, literally pictures, whatever, just everything you eat for the day. And then sometimes miraculously it starts to come down because it's like, okay, maybe they weren't measuring accurately. So, you know, it's that's probably the most common thing is just seeing whether or not people are consistently following what's on the sheet, whether it's, you know, eyeballing measurements, you know, like the, the scoop of peanut butter starts to get taller and taller. Or, you know, eh, that's, that's probably yeah, about it. They start using an ice cream scoop yeah. for it instead of the <laughs> exactly. regular spoon. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're, you're scooping it right out of the yeah, thing yeah. into your mouth. And it's like, wow, it's probably getting followed by two or three more, you know. And so that kind of stuff comes up more or less. But thankfully, we haven't had any, like, real big, you know, health issues with anybody. It's just, it's, I, like I said, a couple of women where their cycle stopped and we had to, like, shift gears. It sounds like um, most of the compliance is, uh, and this is obvious, right, is following yeah. with the nutritional side, not sticking to the trainings. Yeah, yeah, the training is, is I'd say, 99% of the time people are on it because like, it's the fun part, you know. Yeah. It's like you get, you get to go nuts and, like, we do intra-workout drinks, so – you know, you're taking in simple sugar and protein and it's like, well, this is nice. You know, some people eat gummy bears or you know, yeah. Skittles or something. So it's like, yeah, you get to all that sugary stuff that you like normally. You get to have that like during your workout. It's like, cool. You know, that part's fun. But then when you're back to like, you know, your 9 p.m. meal is a casein shake with nothing. Yeah. Like, yeah pass. Hard pass, man. <laughs> all right. Now, with, with with your training, where where does your bias fall? So let's say mm -hmm. if I could divide periodization into three groups and yeah. I know we can't, and I know they're all, yeah, I'm, I'm just yeah. making this as simple as I can. There's linear and there's block and then there's mm -hmm. conjugate. I'm going to assume your, your block, you kind of fall. Yeah, probably closer to that. Thing. Some little features of conjugate here and there, you know, yes. rotating exercises, stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. Now, so when a client, so when you onboard the client mm -hmm. and they're not competitive power lifter by, which is 90% yeah. of them, I'm sure. Um, what phasic structure, are, after you get through an introduction phase, I mean, mm -hmm. how are you laying this out over a yeah. period of time? So from one block, granted, I know blocks change, but there's, yeah. there's going to be patterns. Yeah. So what are the general patterns that you're using? Yeah, so usually what I'll do is, um, well, depending on their experience level, if you've got somebody with some lifting background, we just get right into it. Yeah. Um, we've got kind of, you know, stuff that I set up for that and say, because the majority of my clients too are looking to lose fat. You know, whether that's, you know, a bunch of it or a little bit of it or whatever, sometimes people say, oh, I just want to perform better. I don't really care what the scale says. Mm -hmm. That's the best. Or massing. People who have never massed before, and all of a sudden they're eating five, 600 calories mm -hmm. or 600 grams of carbs in a day, and they're like, this is incredible. What are we doing? Um, but most, most people, we start off with, like, hypertrophy work. But, like I said, kind of with that powerlifting slant of, like, yeah. squats, you know, deadlifts or RDLs or something, some benching, some shoulder pressing, something like that. Um but aiming for that, you know, eight to 15 rep range. And because it's, it's just a nice stimulus for muscle growth or muscle retention while you're in a deficit. So we get them going on, you know, a little bit of a caloric deficit. We get the reps up there, uh, just kind of keep bumping from there, you know, and each month maybe, you know, the volume goes up a little bit. The intensity definitely goes up. You know, we try to progress, you know, 5%. So the blocks are in like around about four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So like for a, a three month diet is kind of on average where we do, yeah. uh, we'll do three months of hypertrophy work, which is like kind of a good time to switch it up anyway. Cause then like you want to have that stimulus be yeah. novel again. So then during maintenance, I'll pair that with like five by five kind of stuff or, you know, depending on the person, if they're really into it, maybe we'll do even like in the threes, and then if somebody's competing, then, you know, then we'll do like a yeah. peak and all, all the way on down. 
but more often than not, it's just kind of like, okay, let's, let's do primarily like bodybuilding style with powerlifting movements and then get into like some heavier stuff just to mix it up. Kind of a little bit fun calories come up a little yeah. bit. Cause you know, I was going to say that, that answered my question that's yeah. going through my head is, you know, how do you, cause for, for most people that aren't really familiar with periodization and mm -hmm. different ways to lay it out, the maintenance phase is a bitch. Yeah. Right? So like, how do you, absolutely. how do you keep that? interesting for a couple of reasons because yeah. you don't want to lose the client for one thing yeah. but it's also very necessary that they do yeah. it which is another thing yeah where you kind of answer the question by yeah you know, bumping yeah trying things. to you know change the things up enough but yeah bumping up the calories a little bit so we start like really slow so maybe it's like 10 grams of fat and 15 grams of carbs going back in so it's still just enough that it kind of comes up a little bit um i recommend especially in the first couple of weeks like that may maintain that same level of discipline that you had when you were cutting just with a little bit more food because, you know, I think a lot of times what I've seen, at least, is that clients, you say, listen, we're, we're going to go into maintenance. We can relax a little bit. And they're like, well, all bets are off, man. I'm, yeah. So, like, really trying to keep a, a rein on that, at least for the first two, three weeks. And then by, you know, the end of the first month, it's like, okay, we start doing maybe weekly cheat meals, maybe twice a week, depending on how the person's responding. And I've even had a lot of people where they'll lose two more pounds in that first month. It's just like. Why do you think so? I think it's just from, like, dropping fatigue. That's the only thing I can really come up with because, like, you would think, like, okay, cal I guess if you look at it, too, because I often pair that with strength training, so maybe because the volume came down. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, though, because, yeah, that's the thing. I'm not really sure. I think maybe just dropping know. fatigue. So no, it's, it's, like it's water, one of those but. weird things because, it's you know, I kind of go to, like, cortisol, and I, yeah. maybe they're stressing because they know right. it's the end of it because as a diet gets a little bit harder, yeah. it, it's harder on you for, for sure. a lot of reasons. Then when you remove that, if it's in a maintenance phase, you kind of removed a big stressor. Yeah. And then maybe just relaxing that stressor. Yeah, for sure. And I, I don't know. Like I said, that, I don't honestly, know. that's that's the best I can come up with. Because like you think like okay, calorie wise, it, it sort of doesn't make sense if we're putting yeah. more in. But it's something I've I've noticed over the last like five six years is just like, it's it's maybe a sixty forty chance that people lose one to two pounds in that yeah. first month. Well, I'll tell you, we know yeah. this, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, we can definitely agree on this that when somebody's under more higher work, emotion, and all this other stress, oh, yeah. they're going to gain weight. Absolutely. You know, even if they're not eating, well, they are eating more, but, yeah. you know, they don't think they are, but they probably yeah. are. There's still, yeah, like water retention and stuff. Yeah. One of the other, like, kind of interesting, like, phenomena is, like, when people travel, especially if they fly, I've noticed with clients, whether they stick to the diet or not, they gain a pound. And it's just like they just bloat mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the pressure change mm -hmm. or what the deal is but there is definitely something to that yeah it's, it's i've just seen like it repeated with. And, and it's like okay you know it's like we'll just watch it and then i'll come back down and everything's fine but it's like almost inevitable that people just gain a little bit of weight when they fly or when they you know drive long distance and then it all kind of you know works itself out but yeah it, it, like strange little things like that you know you start to see over the years it's like okay yeah i see no that. Those, i mean those sometimes if i don't let it because the way my brain works they get like yeah. it's stuck in my brain then i'll start going down a rabbit hole to try to figure it out yeah then i realize it's like three people i know so yeah. like who gives a <laughs> shit and they've already figured out how to mitigate it yeah but it's like why you know it's just yeah. weird there's there's a lot of and i guess that's just training and yeah science, everything in general you oh know? yeah and that's There's something to like bring to clients too. Be like, listen, you know, because you know everybody, especially when they're trying to cut and they're like really working hard. Be like, listen, don't freak out. All hope is not lost. Like this is something I've seen a million times. Just ride it out for the week, and they're always like, oh yeah, it came back down. We're good. It's like, yep, all set. Mm -hmm. During women's cycle, you know, I mean that's that's pretty well known too, right? Women yeah. hold water during their cycle. I have a lot of women clients. That's why you mm -hmm. know it's, it's something that comes up a lot. Um, but yeah, you know, even like I've had people go, you know special event and they're like oh my god you know i'm up five pounds it's like you did not gain five pounds of tissue in a day i promise no, you i know I'm, yeah. well, I'm, I'm, I'm internally <laughs> laughing way louder yeah. than what you think i am right now <laughs> you know because i mean you hear the stupid shit too you know like <laughs> you know I, they started taking some interest shit and saying, man i put on five pounds of muscle like, you, you you did not right <laughs> you know in like a month a, a week sometimes yeah. it's like you, no you didn't yeah, you know, so you, think about how it, long it took you to gain the last five pounds you put on, right? Oh, <laughs> God, you know, supplement yeah. ads don't help for you know on yeah. that side either. It's like people don't understand <laughs> how big of a uh, for somebody to put on ten pounds of muscle in one year is yeah. almost almost impossible. Yeah, you know, but uh, I gained thirty pounds of muscle last year. Like, oh, God. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you need to be studied in a lab then. <laughs> hey, hey, well, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, with uh, getting back into your own 
powerlifting because yeah. I still can't get over this <laughs> rec center thing. I really can't. It was um, a blast, man. No, I mean it's it's like <clears throat> when when you when you because you still communicate with those guys, you, yeah. Right. So yeah. when you guys start talking about those those days back then, mm. what's one of the stories that always pops up? Like, oh man, you remember that time? Uh, well, there was. There was a character, as, as most commercial gyms have. There's, there's always a character. Um, this guy didn't get along with anybody, and as, as politely as I can say it, he was a fucking asshole. I mean, he yeah. just didn't put his stuff back. I mean, not just like, oh, I left the dumbbells out, like a dozen plates on the ground. <laughs> he wasn't using a dozen, but he left a dozen on the ground. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing, man? And mm -hmm. actually, Mark got into it with him the one time. He's like, just clean up your shit, man. He's like, I don't work here. He said, I don't care. Like, respect the place, right? Mm -hmm. So this guy, they had already kind of squared off once or twice, and he was five, 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 six, maybe 160 pounds. So it's not like he was in a position to be telling anybody off. And <laughs> he loaded up the uh, the Smith machine, I don't know, with like 275, right? You know, two plates and a quarter on each side. And he came up to us, and he's like, hey, can one of you guys spot me? And Mark goes, yeah, he will. I was like, okay, all right, fine, whatever. Go over there. And he goes, it's like twice my weight. I don't know how many I'm going to get. I was like, okay, let's rock and roll, man. And before I could even, like, get set, he unracked it. He goes, help me down. I said, what? Because I didn't hear him right. And just, like a freight train to the floor. And I was like, what? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it was a Smith machine, thankfully, so it didn't, like, crush him. But he's laying there in a heap. And I was like, dude, like, what, what was that? And he goes, you're a bad spotter. And... Like, I'm, I'm usually a pretty even guy. But I said, that is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. Don't you ever talk to me again. Like, you're nuts. Like, mm -hmm. And I, I walked away. Mark was on the floor, like, laughing. He could not help himself. He was mm -hmm. like, I knew it was going to happen. I knew that's why I sent you in there. The whole thing. I was like, oh, my God. So, yeah. But <laughs> so that one usually comes up. But, like, as far as the <laughs> trials and tribulations of multiply and erectplex, I mean, there was one day, I said, we had this goofy setup with the pins and the squat rack. For, for squat day and you know mark came in and we're we're going and you know it was one of those days like the mood was kind of off and you know we're just we're just going we're not even talking we're just like getting after it a little bit and i didn't pull the pin far enough out i didn't even realize it mm -hmm. i just pulled it and i went to the side to spot and on he came back up and just oh he hit the pin oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah 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 like six six fifty on the mm -hmm. bar <laughs> we, you know wrestled it back yeah, in the yeah. rack and he looked at me he's like well that's tough too because you got to wrestle it back and oh, up and yeah you, yeah i mean you gotta move it yeah. all around and i was like oh i'm so sorry i like and it was it was the funniest thing because also it like broke the tension though like everything yeah. was cool after yeah. that but it <laughs> completely broke us like jeez man we almost died you know yes. and like stuff like that there was i was getting ready for it was actually my first multiply meet and i caught food poisoning like two weeks before so in and out of the bathroom the whole time and mm -hmm. he was like well you gotta train man i was like this is a bad idea he's like well you gotta <laughs> that <fire. laughs> yeah i was like i'm not getting in the suit dude <laughs> so i'm gonna have to throw it away <laughs> he's like all right fine. so i wound up I, I just like raw worked up to like 475 and i was like we're really pushing it like i gotta go home we're done <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah thankfully you know there wasn't any big injuries you know we didn't have to dump any benches or anything which was great yeah and that like really looking, that was really the riskiest thing that we did because I mean, it was just it was mostly just two of us. Yeah, you know, and like I said, his like you know at the time the girl he was dating was like 140 pounds, just like holding boards for us. So it was like that could have been it, you know. Yeah. And yeah. the the guy that you're talking about the the Smith machine bench, he, yeah, he he's like the, that guy, right? Because yeah, <clears throat> while in college I worked at a gym, you know, managing a gym, and so I. I have some experience in commercial gyms. It was still a hardcore bodybuilding gym, but there's always you yeah. know, that guy, right? Yeah. So what I would do, and so that, that's actually way easier than the, how I handled those things. That's, that's way <laughs> easy. That's way better. Just let them get smashed. That's definitely yeah. the best way. <laughs> what I would do with that guy yeah. is because they basically they, they want you to, it's a force rep, right? Yeah. And a lot of people just naturally just help them so much. Yeah. I would make that the longest concentric <laughs> rep they've ever had in their life. Yeah. I, I would not, I, I would make it so freaking slow that they would have to tell me, take it, take it, take it. <laughs> now, granted, sometimes it just, I'm, my arms are burning, my traps oh, are yeah. burning, because it's always the bench, right? Right. And it's just, and I'm like, 
in my head, I'm like, you motherfucker, <laughs> you know, you're going to pay and then yeah. never ask me to spot again. <laughs> and now I'm thinking I should have just let it just right. <laughs> Yeah, crush them. take its course. Yeah. That was my goal for them to never <laughs> ask me for a spot again. Yeah. Right. Because you would see, like, you'd hear about that guy. Oh, yeah. Then you'd see them, like, looking around. You're like, oh, God, I don't know. He was notorious, man. Yeah. And they, they actually, they, the day that, like, him and Mark got into it, they, uh, you know, he, like, told he like told him off. He's like, no, man, like, be respectful and, like, clean this stuff up. And the guy goes, I'm going to sue you. And, like, sue him. Yeah. He's like, for what, man? Get out of here. <laughs> it's like, Fuck off, you know, and, and it's funny because Mark's a lawyer, so it's like try it, <laughs> try it, you know. <laughs> no, that's that. That would be a problem. Yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous, man. We, oh, we had a. There was another like that guy encounter, and he, everything wound up being fine. But this was by the time I had made it to Chicago, um, and he wound up being a decent dude. He just he had a bad week from what he told me after the fact. But as a trainer, and. You know, he was, like, kind of getting in the face of some of the powerlifter guys. I, I used to train at quads. Not, like, old quads, yeah, yeah. but new quads. Um, fantastic gym. I love that place. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, like, that's where my, my raw lifting really took off when I was training there. Um, but there was this guy, and, you know, he had clients and stuff. But he started just, like, messing with the powerlifter guys. Cause, like, you know, as we – I don't know if you know this about powerlifters, Dave, but we take a little while when we're using a squat rack. Yeah, a little yeah. while. <laughs> so – you know, like Just my buddy. clean it and stuff for right. us. <laughs> <laughs> Got my, my cot set up next to it. But. No, so it was uh, one of my buddies was deadlifting the one day, and he, like, gave him a hard time. So, like, there was already this, like, thing floating around. Like, yeah, this guy's whatever. He's being weird. And so I had, like, a bad day at work. This was, like, in that, that zone of uh, – it was in residency, so I was, you know, doing hospital stuff again, and I was, like, stressed and all this other stuff. I think I was getting ready for a meet, so I was, like, really just kind of – you know, peak anger kind of thing. You know, yeah. I wasn't having any of it. This other guy who was working in Chicago, he was from Spain, nicest dude, power lifter. You know, he was like a 165 or 178, something like that. Um, he was squatting in the rack next to me, and we're just kind of, you know, shooting the breeze, doing our sets. Well, dude comes over, and he goes to, to Miguel, and he's like, are you fucking done yet? He's like, what? He's like, are you done with this rack? You've been here all day. And he's like, you can work in, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, and – so it starts to kind of escalate. Mind you, the guy's client's standing right next to him. And I'm not having it. And I'm not, like, I'm really not a confrontational guy. Mm-hmm. It's just not who I am. But I had put my weight back. It was just a long day. And I was like, why don't you come talk to me? He's like, what? I'm like, you never asked me for the rack. Why is that? And I just, like, I got in his face. And he's like, well, you know, i got to do this and this. And he's like, it's my livelihood and blah, blah. I'm like, I don't care about any of that, bro. I was like, we paid him to work mm-hmm. out here. We're going to work out here. And I was like, there's 5,000 pieces of equipment here that you can use for this and you know it's like this whole back and forth and you guys do this and then he's like well you know what do you do for work and i'm like i'm a doctor man he's like oh oh yeah i didn't know that and i was like listen i don't give a shit what you're doing here man i said you talk about being professional so you come over here dropping f-bombs in front of your client i was like what is that (laughs) yeah i was like not once you come over here and ask you just started barking at us i was like i'm trevor nice to meet you next time like yeah let's figure this out and so he you know he took off that day and like to his credit he came up to me like the next time in the gym and he was like hey man he's like i was having a bad week he's like you know like we're good I was like, yeah we're good yeah you know it's all safe. and we're you know we're fine after that but it was just like funny because bennett had a very similar encounter like almost to the t at his gym in florida or, or mark in, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, in florida um like two weeks before that and we both said the same thing, you know, like introduced ourselves. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Like, how is this such a consistent thing from like gym to gym across the country that, they're, you know, somebody's in a bad mood and they're just, you know, it's just like a whole thing. But, you know, it's just gym culture, right? You get all, I, I have all no, that yeah, ego. Yeah, yeah, was, <laughs> fortunately, you yeah. know, most of my time we're always in private gyms, which is different types of drama that you're dealing with. Oh, yeah. You know, and not so much that kind of, you know, crap like that but i would see you know sometimes i'd see it when managing it whatever like just this is so stupid it's yeah whatever it makes no sense to me yeah and um but when you're in the powerlifting gyms all the time you know it's 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 so it's so different yeah i mean it it was because i grew up that way you know Mm -hmm. i i came into the whole thing that way through those type of places so I, I can remember when I went to college, I was like so excited. I'm like, I'm gonna be in a commercial gym. They got machines and shit. I mean, they got all yeah. this stuff. This is like Disneyland. Yeah. You know, then it's like this 
kind of sucks. Like like, people here. Nobody <laughs> gives a shit about their training. It's like, yeah. this is just crazy. You know, then you find the little culture of the other powerlifters that you're in, and you end yeah. up back into a powerlifting club. And then every now and again, it's, it's, it's weird because if I'm traveling or something like that, I'll go in a commercial gym, and yeah. it's just like, I cannot, it's, it's, <laughs> I can't do it. I, yeah. I mean, I could, if I have to, right. I'll figure you it out. Right, do you gotta do, yeah. I would rather just be in like a hotel yeah. place with nobody in it, with right. techno gym <laughs> shit, and just make that work, yeah. than I have to deal with oh, yeah. all the crap, you know, that's, yeah. out, that's just. This is the thing too, it's like, even like at quads, you know, it's like, it's, it's a serious gym mm -hmm. with more of like commercial slant nowadays, just cause that's, you know, that's what happens. and. But yeah, even that, like you still ran into a lot of that kind of ego stuff. And then like, I forget now though, cause I, I train in my basement like by myself. Mm -hmm. And so like a client will tell me like, Hey, can we rearrange the workout? Cause like, you know, Tuesday nights, the, the rack is taken or the bench is taken. It's like, Oh yeah, that's right. You gotta, you gotta contend with that shit. Don't you? Mm -hmm. That sucks. Okay. Yeah. Move things around and all that stuff. But yeah, it's, it's a whole, whole different world. I do miss like training with people though. Mm -hmm. Like just having, even just one training partner. I had awesome training partners at quads and still keep up with them. They they drive out to the suburbs sometimes to, to work out in my basement mm -hmm. and stuff. But like yeah, I, I miss the the communal aspect of it when you got a good crew. But no, that's a the huge rest of it, a, yeah, you it's know. it's weird though because it's it's one of those things that you know, it used to bother me because slowly you start to see this disintegration of yeah. like a powerlifting crew if I'm just to mm -hmm. stay in my own personal world. I mean you see this disintegration of it and it's like this is important right because yeah. you got if there's four other people you got four other eyes on your lift you know yeah. you got four coaches and yourself i mean mm -hmm. and i'm granted people say what they want about the phones but you got a phone too so now you got five other eyes on yourself and yeah. the ability to rewind pause and look absolutely and that's that's a that's a huge thing for being able to get better and it just you know it, it gets to this place where you know nobody wants to do it seems like nobody sees the value in that yeah and i'm like this is just weird for a lot of reasons yeah. societal reasons there's weird oh yeah you know and i think we crave you know yeah togetherness or what tri oh, tribalism sure. whatever yeah. you want to call it you know it's part of that but it's 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 hurting their gains but i'm trying now it's so weird now that i'm trying to explain this thing that we're talking about mm -hmm. to people that have never experienced it before yeah like we can talk about it because oh, we yeah. know what we're talking about. They have no idea what we're talking about. Yeah, and I have these conversations with my coworker. Yeah, and she's like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's, it's like, like this. Uh, it's like, like this trying to find huge... an analogy for, for I know. people not in it is it's impossible. That's, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. How, how do you how do you find an analogy for that? Because it's like this yeah. huge benefit, like finding gold. Yeah. Right. That it's right there. Yeah. But they're blind to it, and you're trying mm -hmm. to explain something. It's it's frustrating oh yeah you know and and it's and i don't know how to you know what i'm saying i don't know how yeah. to explain that because i mean the and it's, it's not covid that changed it this is all changing be way, way oh, yeah, well before sure. that it, it's just expedited it so yeah. I, I don't really like people blaming it on that right it definitely expedited it oh, but yeah. this was happening way before that yeah. way way before and i don't know why i get with multiply you're getting because people's got to pull your straps oh and yeah shit like that but even raw lifters were training in groups yeah at some point it just i don't know why yeah i know really like for my thing it was just like as i got busier and then we moved and all that you yeah. know like a lot of life stuff came up and then you know it just like could i still drive to quads like i could i mean it's gonna take me an hour and a half mm -hmm. and after you know i'm working and family and all that other stuff it's like I don't know why. I just got to train in my basement. No, no, you know, I get that. Like, yeah, like I, stuff I, like I, that. But yeah. no, I think you're you're right though. I mean, probably, it's probably a number of things. You know, it's people in general are, are kind of busy. You know, and I, I think finding people that are as dedicated. Not to say that people aren't dedicated, but like to that. It should be easier now, though, right? You because, would think, yeah. With, with you know, because what you're talking what about is. is kind of like a, a natural progression of, you know. Yeah you move through the sport, then you mm. kind of move out of the sport. Yeah. But there's always other people coming in, mm -hmm. right? And just for you to find training partners, you just stumbled across one. Oh yeah, right? I lucked out big time, man. Yeah, I mean, I mean fantastic. And, I mean, before know. we're like, people are like on the outlaw powerlifting board. Right. And, you know, everybody's just, they're working their ass off to yeah. try to find a crew. It wasn't easy to find a crew. Oh, I bet, and yeah. Then when you found one, you know, it was, it was a locked in place and they were all yeah. private gyms and it wasn't, 
it, it's way easier now. You yeah. would think everybody posts their shit right. on yeah, Instagram. Social media, right? I mean, yeah. that's like, yeah, it should be should be easier. But you're right. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like that's the, the thing anymore. I mean, it's maybe because of maybe some of the shift towards raw lifting where, like, you don't have to have yeah. as many guys. So you kind of just find yourself self-sufficient or, you know, and... Yeah, that's, it's kind of strange because like the community is bigger than it's ever been with powerlifting. I feel yeah. like oh, it's, it's huge. Yeah, but yeah, it's just kind of a strange situation. Yeah, but where when um, I was, I was looking at the numbers. It's been a couple of years, so I don't mm-hmm. want to say this is true now because I haven't looked in a couple of years. But open powerlifting's got freaking yeah. everything. You know, well, at least through my whole career, they probably have every meet I've ever done except maybe ten percent of the ones that didn't count because I was right. too young and it was like a high school or yeah. whatever type, whatever. And uh, but everything's there and. Years back, I looked because people will say multiply is dead. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I want to see for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, it's actually grown a oh, little right? bit. But it's, 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 it, we're talking, you went from like 2,500 lifters mm-hmm. when in 2000s, you yeah. know, maybe, maybe 2,000 to 3,000, somewhere mm-hmm. in there. And I don't know what it is now, but it's about the same now, you know, 2,000 yeah. to 3,000. So it hasn't died. It, yeah. just, it didn't grow or it just grew right. a tiny There's bit. There's just that many more. Yeah, but raw, raw yeah. went from like nothing to mm. a couple hundred thousand. Yeah. You know, so it's you insane. can't, yeah, you can't say <laughs> one thing died if it's still the same. That's true. Yeah. I can say it didn't grow it's, at the uh, rate that the other one yeah, did. It's diluted now. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> or even before though, I mean, you were in it, right? I yeah. Mean, so you know that single ply, there are way more single ply lifters than multi ply. Yeah. There's a big misconception here. Mm. It was all geared, so we can, it was right. all geared. Yeah. But I would say probably 80% of the lifters competitively were single mm. ply. Yeah. I mean, that was IPF, that was most of the meets. And mm-hmm. the other 20% were multi, maybe 25%. Yeah. I'm sure we can look on open powerlifting and right. find it for, you can filter the shit really easy. Yeah. You know, really, yeah, USAPL not. grew really big. And that, I mean, to your yeah. point, like with the single ply and everything, and USAPL, I think that became like a good, uh, a good entry point for a lot of people because you know like the rules are you know mm-hmm. really strict and you know they're, they're really big on like the raw and, and yeah. minimal assistance and stuff like that so i think it was more appealing to people that didn't come up with like the the multiply history mm-hmm. of it right i mean as i said my first introduction to powerlifting was was you know you guys and like looking mm-hmm. at the west side guys and stuff like that so i was like okay that's that's powerlifting my mm-hmm. first meet that i went to um i saw um, janae you know mm-hmm. croc at the time um squat a thousand pounds and mm-hmm. i was like what the fuck did i get myself into oh yeah you know, I like, i'm not squatting a thousand pounds yeah. i know that yeah that was, i mean it was a crazy meet mm-hmm. so there was that um kurt croc squatted like 800 and then blew his knee out mm-hmm. didn't make a sound he sat on the ground he goes i think i blew my knee out i'm done mm-hmm. and then sat in a chair and watched the rest of the day i was like what clay brandenburg bench 931 mm-hmm. um there was a, there was another guy that squatted a thousand it was like neck and neck and it was like the most incredible thing. And I was like, so you were in Michigan at the time or yeah. in Florida? Yeah. yeah I, mean, I, was in I mean, yeah, you're dealing with Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, right. New York. You're dealing with. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. Know, that, yeah. you know, cause, and it was funny, too, because, like, my parents, you know, super supportive. They weren't, like, athletes growing up or anything. But, like, me and my brother got involved in sports. And they were at every game, every wrestling meet, everything, you know, wearing the school colors, you know, supportive, everything. And so I was like, oh, okay, this is just the next sport. So they showed up wearing, like, a Michigan hoodie. And it's a powerlifting meet. Yeah. Blasting metal. You oh, know, yeah full-blown multiply you know demonia salts the yeah, whole thing yeah. oh yeah <laughs> they were like um trevor what what are we doing here like, yeah and my grandma was there and everything like, she's like that lady she said you should wrap your knees like okay grandma thank you <laughs> oh yeah and then they're bored out of their mind because yeah. it's, it's it's the worst thing in the oh, world yeah. to watch you know i had so. a, an ex-girlfriend that came to a meet she goes i love you but i don't love this so i'm gonna go and yeah like, okay <laughs> yes that, that, that's that's most of the audience were like yeah you know girlfriends wives yeah you know oh yeah um other lifters just waiting yeah you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not oh, really yeah. like this spectator sport yeah and i told them too you know because then like especially further on in my career i was like listen man i, I love this sport I, I live and die for this shit but i'm bored too so like if if you guys don't want to stick around like i get it like there's a number of my meets where my dad filmed like the squat and the bench and then there's just no deadlift. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they're like, all right, man, we gotta go. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did you did you go back because you were in multiply then, yeah. I assume the raw came after that. Yeah. Um, was that because of, you know, just lack of training partners find a multiply or yeah. time? Because, uh, both. You know, both. Yeah. So like I, I started like college, um, mostly raw and then kind of dabbled a little bit in single ply, just like, you know, here and there. Uh, a buddy of mine had some briefs, so he like let me use those a little bit. 
but most of it was really just raw lifting. And then I got a single ply shirt, like my senior summer, try that a little bit. And then by the time I got to Florida, then I met Mark and he got me into the multiply thing. Like mm -hmm. I signed up for a meet and I was planning on doing single ply with like the briefs underneath. And like, I don't know, two weeks out, I was like, well, I'm gonna get the ace. I'm gonna see mm -hmm. what that's about. No, yeah, 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 <laughs> so yeah. Just like trying to figure it out. And you know, it just kind of went from there. And then he graduated ahead of me. So he started working, you know, like an actual attorney job. You know, he worked for the state for a little bit. So I was like, I can't do this by myself. And like, I needed to study more and all that kind of thing. So like, I took my three hour squat workout down to an hour just because I was just, you know, squatting wraps and then I would get out of there. So that was a big shift. And then that was around the time that I moved to Chicago. Like my last year of med school, I was in Chicago for rotations and stuff like that. So it was like, I was pretty well into it at that point with the raw lifting and I found training partners that lifted raw. So I was like, I just, I gotta stick with this. Mm -hmm. And quads didn't have a, I'm sure they still don't have a mono lift. And you know, unless you got three people to pull pins yeah, and all yeah, that yeah, stuff, yeah. it's like, well, I can't like walk out a multiply squat. I'm going to kill myself, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So then that's, that's really where more of the shift went in, in raw lifting and part of like the whole takeoff too. So, like I said, I got into powerlifting partly because of Isertel, and he graduated ahead of me. So, like, we kind of lost touch a little bit, and then he happened to come down to Florida for vacation, and so we kind of met up again. We trained together, and I was like, you know, I'll take a look at my deadlift, and he, like, wrote out a progression for me for a meet. And so after that, I was like, all right, man, what's what's next? He's like, well, you need to get bigger. I said, okay, that sounds like fun. He goes, you're going to be 290 pounds in, you know, 12 weeks. And that sounds like Mike. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you know, well, he's like, you're going to be what I call a true 275, which means you'll be 290 cut to 275. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So we did that. And then it was like, I was consistently 290 in the mornings. And then I was like, all right, what's next? He goes, you're going to be a true 308. So you're going to be 325. And I was like, no. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, I got to tap, dude. I can't. Like the day that I, that it was Thanksgiving day, I hit 295 and I felt like garbage. And I was like, I don't think this is sustainable. Like this is really going to be, and this is before I even got into all the other health stuff. I was like, this is just not going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so Mark had told me, he said, if you hit 300, I'm going to bake you a cake. And I was like, it's probably gonna be a shit cake anyway. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah, I, I dropped down to like 270 from there and then stuck there for like years. And that's really where I was most successful. Um, that one meet that I did 308 multiply, I was, oh, shoot, what was I? 276. I was 285 for the 275 meet, mm -hmm. but I was 276 for the 308 meet. Interesting. Because I like, I was like, well, do I go throw up? And he's like, yeah. don't do that. He's like, you know, if you don't make weight, then what are you going to do? Yeah. I was like, all right, fine. So, but you know, the, the fun with power or with multiply is you just tighten the shit down. And, yeah. You know, I lifted more at that one than I did the other one. <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here with yeah. this question where the, there's, there's obviously a bunch of people that train and the, the, the main objective for why they train is aesthetics you know yeah. what, what they look like um most i don't want to say all but most of the power lifters was it come from the strength background it's, mm -hmm. it's not really we i don't want to say i don't give a shit about what i look like but right. i really don't you know yeah. i'm going to say that you kind of feel the same way right yeah, it, yeah it i'm married i'm good Let's, like, <laughs> whatever right <laughs> yeah. but that that becomes an obstacle yeah. like it's, as we get older because most of the training that we probably should be doing would be yeah. suited more towards training that's for aesthetics oh, instead for sure. of the strength you yeah. know and it's uh it's a battle you yeah. know sometimes where how do you kind of play that mm -hmm. that instrument right because it's it'd be so much uh, this is how i think it's grass is always greener right yeah it'd be so much easier if i actually gave a fuck about abs and shit like oh that, yeah but i don't yeah you know i care about being strong <laughs> <laughs> so it, oh, it's, i hear you man yeah that so was how like, do you that was my philosophy on the way up too because like i was like i said i was 165 to 200 in in high school and i was I, I got measured, I mean, it was skin full, but I was measured at like seven and a half percent at yeah. one point. So I was like, I've done abs. That's fine. Yeah. This is more fun. I can eat whatever I want. And I liked being stronger and I was good at it, you know, like compared to my peers and stuff, mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I'm stronger than the average guy. That's cool. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I, I certainly ran with that whole idea of like stronger is fun. And then at some point more recently, like trying to force myself into the aesthetic side of things. Uh, once I had kind of retired from powerlifting, I was like, well, I'm, I'm not strong enough to be this fat anymore and I'm not lean enough to say that I'm in shape. So like, I got to do something mm -hmm. and you know, then looking at like the future longevity mm -hmm. and all that stuff, that's all important anyway. So I was like, all right, this is probably more of what I need to be doing. So I'm just going to do it and you know, save me from myself. I just need to change my goal. I just gotta, ha I have to have a different goal or I'm 
you know, I'm going to spin my wheels and be frustrated that I'm not as strong as I used to be and, or, you know, get myself hurt or something like mm-hmm. that. So, yeah. So like, the, I should probably say why. But what's the carrot? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, oh, like how do I stay motivated? Yeah. I mean, we've taken away the carrot, you know, yeah. so I found ways to put different carrots in. Like, right. what is the carrot to be able to keep? Yeah. Because if, it, I mean, if it's just this, you know, it's, it's hard to say, cause it, at some point it, it just kind of clicked of like, I think it helped to look at it from the perspective of like longevity. You know, it's like, I, I want to be able to chase my kids, you know, as cliche as that sounds like, I really, I want to be able to do that. I need to be healthy enough. Not that I'm like on the verge of death or anything. Yeah, but like, yeah. I, I want to be healthy enough that I can like be a part of their life. And like, there was the first couple of years of my kid's life. He was like, it's okay. He literally said to me, it's okay, daddy. You don't have to get on the ground. I was like, well, that sucks, man. I should be able to like, get on the ground to play with them. Mm-hmm. You know, I might creak when I do it. But I need to be able to do that. And, you know, he's, he's an active kid. He wants to play soccer. He wants to run. He wants to do all that stuff. So I, gotta, I have to be able to keep up with that, you know. So, like, that turned into more of a motivator. You know, kids change everything, right? Mm-hmm. So that was a big motivator. Um, fortunately, something just sort of shifted in my head. I think it was, like, you know, the two years since I said I'm done with powerlifting, I finally hit that point of, like, you know, kind of like you mentioned before, like, you know, you get kind of greedy when you feel good and you start to lift mm-hmm. a little heavier. It's like I'm watching the numbers come down. It's like – I'm not going to get in that, you know, almost 500 bench range again. It's just not going to happen. So it's like, why am I chasing that? If it's just going to lead to pain and suffering and, and frustration, it's like, I got to just do something else. And it's like, part of it honestly is like the, I still enjoy lifting. So that enough is like to keep me going. I think it's, there's still benefit in being stronger than average, you know, just as, you know, whatever benchmark you put for that, there's still benefit in that. Mm-hmm. Um, some of it's not, I just don't know what else to do, man. Like I, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't like running. I'll do it now and again. Um, like I know a lot of people get into like jujitsu and stuff and that's awesome, but I didn't like wrestling in high school. So like, I don't know that I'd be really into jujitsu. It's like, this is something I know. And it's something I, I can still be kind of good at, even if I'm not great at it now. And like, me and my, <laughs> me and my buddies kind of joke about calling it, uh, you know, stopping strength instead of starting strength. Yeah. It's like, how do you transition into not being a powerlifter anymore? You know, like, how do you change that mindset? You know, I mean, for some people it is just say, okay, well, I'm just going to pick a different sport, you know, whether it's bodybuilding or, 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 you know, jujitsu or running or something, take that competitive mindset and put it into something else. It's like, okay, well, that's an option. Or we can say, maybe we just, you know, see how much money we can make. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. at a certain point, like, yeah, that's great and everything, but it's, it, gets to be diminishing return because then it takes away from my family you yeah. know what I, I could get more done lifting for my mental health than i would you know picking up a third job or fourth, mm-hmm. you know something like that so it's like trying to find a way to divert that energy and still be productive in a way because i think that's that's probably important to a lot of people just feeling productive feeling useful mm-hmm. um kind of seeing the needle move you know because if you're like stagnant then you know like kind of what's the point so it's like you got to find progress in something you know right now it's okay i i needed to cut weight i'm going to cut a little bit more weight so like that's at least a concrete goal um something measurable you know that always appeals to me about powerlifting too is like either you picked it up or you didn't pick it up so now it's like okay i can i gotta get to 230 so i can you know i, I know in the spring or whenever I, I run at it again i could do 12 13 14 pounds whatever i gotta do that's a measurable goal and i can focus on that for a little bit what I do when I get there, I mean, I don't know. I got to pick something else. I'm not going to go to 220. Mm-hmm. I better not. You know, I'm gonna be upset if I do. But like, maybe okay. Do I try and get as strong as I can? I mean, I could try and beat my college numbers, something like that. Or maybe, maybe the maybe the goal is just to like, you know, fix this guy upstairs and say, you know, be be comfortable with something closer to mediocrity. Not saying give up, but like be okay with being a little bit more normal than, do your yeah. do your rp clients soften the blow yeah it helps to, to be attached to things you know still be involved in fitness i mean getting to do this i mean this is huge man yeah i mean really not to like i'm not trying to blow smoke or anything yeah. but like this is a big thing for me because i mean in in my eyes like you know you are like a big part of powerlifting you know and like being able to sit down and be like holy shit man i get to meet like you know one of my yes. idols kind of thing thank you um it, you know, I'm still connected to it. So it's like, no, I'm not the elite lifter anymore, yeah. but I, I can still say, Hey man, I'm, I'm in that world. I'm bringing that knowledge to other people. You know, I'm helping my clients out. I'm getting people healthier. You know, like I've, I kind of the other side of things, not so much powerlifting, but like I've had clients, you know, close to 400 pounds. And then, you know, now they're like 350 or 300. It's like, dude, we just put years on somebody's life. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. You know, and I didn't even have to write them a prescription for it. You know, and then I can bring that knowledge into my, 
you know, my day job, you know, my, yeah. my career, right? My, as a doctor and stuff. So it's like still finding a way to, to do good for, for all that stuff. You know, like I, you know, everybody wants to do something for kind of leave their mark and, and help people out and all that kind of thing, I think at least, but you know, I, it, it does help in that regard, you know, still saying like, okay, I, I know the, some of the stumbling blocks that you you might face, this is how you can get around that. So you mm-hmm. don't make the same mistakes I did, you know, do your cardio, get your blood pressure under control. So then you can power lift until you're 40 or 50. Whereas I had to kind of stop earlier, you mm-hmm. know? So like that, that is beneficial. You know, it's very, and like, it's, it's helpful mentally for me to kind of like, you know, continue moving forward from yeah. power lifting. Now, if this might be a, I'm, you may have considered this or not considered this, but yeah. so you, you have your, your patients, then you have your clients, right? Mm-hmm. So if, you know, both blow up, yeah. you see what I'm saying? And, and you, yeah. you were half, and at some point this probably is going to have, is going to happen. Right. Yeah. And you had to pick. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, you, right. Cause I, can, I, mean, I, I considered it like when I first got out of residency, cause I'd already started coaching. Yeah. Coaching was going well. Um, my wife has a great job. So I was like, maybe I just coach. And, you know, on the one hand, you look at it as, well, you just went to school for a long time. You should probably do that. You know, like I trained, you know, you know I, college and med school and all this other stuff, like all that shit I went through. Like I should probably use that education. It was still something I was passionate about. And, you know, I've been fortunate that I found jobs that like made it enjoyable. So it kept me moving forward. And like at one point, though, I, I called Nick Shaw and I was like, hey, man, I'm kind of considering like just coaching. He's like, eh, it's better for business if you're practicing. I said, OK, that's fair. Thank God he told me that, man, because, mm-hmm. like... No, he's got a point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but, like, really, and coaching's fantastic, but it's it's different. You know, there's ebbs and flows to it. So I'm very grateful that I have a consistent job, and I really love my job. I do. I mean, my mm-hmm. patients are awesome. My staff is awesome. Um, all my colleagues, coworkers, all that stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm really very happy with that. So, like, if I didn't have that, I would feel like I was missing something. And... As much as I, I want them both to be, you know, to, to blow up, like you said, um, I like having both, you know, because it, mm-hmm. it keeps my foot in that, you know, in the fitness world still, because it is still an interest, you know, and it's, yeah. you know, being connected to it really helps me, you know, feel like, all right, well, I didn't like completely leave, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And I think your perspective, yeah. as I said at the at the onset of the, yeah. of the show, is mm-hmm. you're one of a very few number of doctors that are going to have that perspective to be able to look at and i don't know what patient it's going to be or what time it's going to be but Mm -hmm. at some point in time you're going to get that washed up meathead patient that's going to reach out to you man i get so excited if somebody tells me they even work out (laughs) well i know that but it's there there, at some point in time you're going to find me when i was 30. you know what i'm saying and they'll be willing to listen and that that can make a huge difference with with that whole spiraling effect plus Mm -hmm. as as nick said it gives you more credibility and clout or whatever you want to call it (laughs) you know in that side but i also think on the other side it allows you to bring fitness and health to your patients in a way that most doctors don't yeah Yeah. i mean honestly i have a couple couple patients that are doing their own trt i'll put it that way so can kind of have that conversation like look man you know i can't condone it obviously right Mm -hmm. i mean medical science etc the standard of care um but if you're doing this i want to make sure you're safe so mm-hmm. like, we're going to keep an eye on your cholesterol. We're going to keep an eye on your blood pressure. I want to see you every three months. You know, mm-hmm. tell me if these things are happening so we can stay ahead of it. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's a good patient that, you know, sees me once a year and he's like, oh, yeah, I was blasting trend over the summer. It's like, well, buddy, I wish you had come to see me over the summer then because yeah. who knows what happened, right? <laughs> well, that's a good point, though, because, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that I stress, not just about American blood work and all the other stuff. Yeah. Is, a lot of the guys I know, it's like they wait until they're in this big, long cruise phase before yeah. they get their blood work done. It's like, dude, you should probably see oh, yeah. you and get your blood work done when you're at your worst. Right. Because, you know, somebody like yourself, you know, they're going to understand, look, this yeah. is the worst case. Right. Right now. Yeah. All right. And that's that's way different yeah. than thinking when they come in, you know, when they've been off or, you know, on a very, very low dose. Yeah you're left thinking this is the worst case right Where yeah, actually exactly. it's their best case which still yeah. might be bad yeah liver enzymes were off the charts all summer and then they come see me they're okay it's like I, yeah <laughs> one guy i mean he wasn't even into the the anabolics or anything but he was just like his liver looked bad for for you know drinking and stuff like mm-hmm. that and i was like man we gotta we gotta check this again. like it's high enough i need to make sure it's not an error and he's like give me a week to dry out i was like 
dude, like we got to do this now. No, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen him since. Yeah. So, oh like, God. Yeah. I know. Like I, I keep calling him. Like you're all right, man. Like call me yeah. back. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's uh, yeah, it's just so important to kind of like try and stay ahead of it, you know. And to to your point, like having that little bit of an inside scoop on you know things that people run into when they're they're dabbling in these things, and you know, because you get advice from people. Yeah, you know, maybe there's like the the old guy in the gym that's like, no, just run a gram, dude. It'll work. Mm-hmm. So like, of course it's gonna fucking work. Oh yeah. Like, <laughs> oh yeah. I don't recommend anybody does that. You yeah. know, it's like there's there's other ways about this. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to that point, I, I'm, I, I think it is good to, to stay in just to kind of like be up on, on what's what, you know, because it's something I didn't realize until much later in life and in, in lifting and stuff is like how prevalent a lot of the compounds and, and anabolics are in just like the general population that oh, don't. Oh, God, now. Yeah, well, especially, yeah, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, we we're kind of talking before about like TRT clinics pop up everywhere. It's a huge, huge industry, you know, and, and I don't want to speak ill of any fellow doctors or mm-hmm. anything but not everybody does the normal protocol not everybody does the the workup you know it's like okay maybe somebody has low testosterone and that is a medical reason to treat it's a reason to replace it um but why you know i mean what if they have a tumor on their pituitary mm-hmm. and we're just like no big deal just just replace well you just missed a, a brain tumor man that's that's important yeah, huge and yeah these places are just like churning them out so it's like you know i I wonder how many people are, are in that category of like, you know, stuff just gets overlooked or, or whatever. So like, I'm glad that I could at least say, Hey, listen, let's do our due diligence here. You know, somebody comes to me and they say, you know, I have fatigue, I have low motivation and you know, all the classic symptoms of like low T I'm like, great. I'm fine with checking. I'm fine with replacing if it's indicated, but we need to, we need to do it the right way. And part of that conversation is how's your sleep? How's your nutrition? Are you exercising? Because just because somebody is 45 years old doesn't mean their testosterone is supposed to be in the toilet. You know, with a lot of my patients, unfortunately, it's, you know, they get up at four in the morning, they work hard all day, they eat like shit. You know, some of these guys drink, they smoke, all this stuff. And it's like, well, maybe we start fixing some of these things mm-hmm. and see where your, your testosterone's at or see how you feel. You know, maybe you've got a diabetes we just, you know, we haven't uncovered yet. It's like, let's fix all that before we dive into this. Because, like, for a lot of people it winds up being like a lifelong commitment of like okay you got to give yourself a shot every week for forever yeah. well and it's it's become i mean it's un, I don't, unfortunately for i don't know how, test has become like a norm yeah you know where before it was like you couldn't talk about we couldn't have this conversation right, right? i'd be demonetized on youtube I mean, it's yeah like, but on the flip side of that there's there, there's people that will literally train for two or three weeks and start taking Trent. Oh, yeah. Because they just assume that that's just part well, that's, of going to the gym and training. Story for you on that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a young guy that I met. He was, like, visiting Chicago and uh, very, very strong. Like, 20 years old, deadlifting 700 pounds raw, just, like, just a monster. He, you know, he's, like, a buck 80, just jacked, like, just – and he's like, oh, cool. Like, I like powerlifting. I was like, yeah, man. Like, you got a lot of potential. This is incredible. I was like, what's your program like? And he's like, well, I just come in. I just, I just like to deadlift. So I pick it up. And, like, you know, I, I like to lift a couple of days a week. He's like, okay, you know, maybe you should try a program. And no joke, he, he, he messaged me on Facebook two or three weeks later. You know where I can get testosterone? It's like, no, I don't. I do not think you should do that. Okay, okay. A couple of weeks later, he's like, so I'm on, you know, like 500 a week. It's like, I don't think you should do that. I think you should get on an actual program. <laughs> okay, okay. Flash forward. Hey, man, insulin is incredible. I was like, you went from test to insulin. He's like, yeah, it's no big deal. He's like, I, you know, I, I dropped myself real low one time, so I know what it would feel like. Oh, my God. I was like, buddy, you're going to die. Like, don't do that. <laughs> I was like, you are not the guy to be doing this. And, you know, flash forward, he tore his hamstring off the bone because he, like, slipped on some ice and all, you know, but just, like, blew up. And he's like, dude. Like, there's so many, so many things you can tweak before you get into that. Like, I'm not going to say that my training was optimal or yeah. my nutrition was optimal, but I got the most out of that, mm-hmm. more or less, that I could through my powerlifting career. And then, you know, even, like, looking at the Multiply stuff, I was like, okay, before I put briefs under my suit, I need to get better at the suit mm-hmm. and, like, you know, eat more and, you know, fix my training and stuff like that. So it's like, man, there's for, – for all of our young listeners right now, please don't jump into all that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, there's so many things and there's so much information out there now, you know, whether it's from elite or oh, RP yeah. or any, or, you know, juggernaut, all those fantastic places. There's so much good information. Like just do, do a little bit of reading. You know, the other side of that is also like, sometimes you just got to put in the work 
you know well of course there's like the paralysis by analysis crew where it's like okay you know what angle should my foot be at it's like do the, the one you can yeah. stand up with like just go do the work for a little bit and like you know keep it simple and then get yeah. into the nitty-gritty of it but yeah <laughs> well i've always liked to equate it to you, it's an ace card you can only play once yeah exactly right so it, why not you know, if it is powerlifting, why not wait until your total is in the 2000s? Then yeah. you flip it to go to 400 more. Right. You flip it when it's 1200. Yeah. You, so you get to 1600. <laughs> Big fucking deal. Yeah. You know, you went from shit to suck, and that's as far as you're going right. to go. You know, go from <laughs> shit suck to good. Yeah. And then flip it for great. You know, oh, if yeah. it's, you know, to to equate it to football, it's like mm. if you if you need to take shit to be able to make your high school varsity team you're probably never going to be good oh, enough yeah. to play in college absolutely you know in college the same way and so forth yeah. they they should probably wait until they're in the nfl and they flip it right. to get another three or four <laughs> years on their career which is yeah. worth millions of dollars yeah absolutely. you know where it's it's a timing thing it's yeah. i don't want to i've always said before the reason i never talked about it was because you know i'm a person that can i don't want to influence one way or another right and my positioning may it may do that yeah. you know so i don't want to be the person that's going to say you know yes do this but mm -hmm. you know because and i don't want to be the person to say don't do this if that's the time that i think that right. they should have to play the card i'd yeah. rather just be like i'm the fuck out of this i'm not right. a doctor like, this <laughs> is know? what can go wrong this is what can go right yeah you know you that's know. that's up for doctors to decide yeah. or you know merrick or people that are not, just not me but yeah I'm grateful now that at least we can have these conversations, right? You know, so people will know because now more than ever, I think that that card's being flipped so freaking oh, yeah. soon, and they're they're really they're actually hurting their gains way more than they think they're helping them. Yeah, for sure, big time. Yeah, you know, yeah, because you know, and you know, kind of that classic thing of like when people kind of make that move and then their you know their muscle strength outpaces their connective tissue strength. And then they blow something off and it's like, okay, well, you know, instead of getting another you know, four mm -hmm. or five years out of your career, you just ended it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, maybe, maybe take your time building that foundation. You know, I mean, that's such a, a consistent theme with all this stuff, right? You want to have that foundation of like, make sure your technique isn't awful, make sure your diet's not awful. And then once you get like really comfortable with all that, start to dial it in and say, okay, you know, like, how can I get the most out of this? You know, especially like young guys, cause you can, you can do almost anything and still get stronger when you're 20. So it's like, get as much out of that as you can. If you can get on a good program, great. But like at some point you got to do the work. I, I trained with a guy in college that he was big on that. Like, okay, well, you know, how many, how many reps at this thing and then how, what angle, which attachment and all that. And it's like, it's like, buddy, you're, you're benching 165. Like you mm -hmm. gotta, you gotta put the work in for a little while before you can really start getting into that, you know? And, I remember uh, Justin Harris had a thing about that, or an article about that, um, with like the DC training. It's like, mm -hmm. who knows, man? Just like do the reps. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Just do a bunch of reps and I then know. then figure it out. It's like, yeah, I don't know, man. It's uh, I, like I'm I'm a little bit more removed from from that side of things now with coaching because most of the people that come to me mm -hmm. are like, you know, I've watched some videos or I need your help on stuff, and I send yeah. videos of like this is how I want it done, and so they've got a pretty good idea, and then we do like feedback and stuff like that. So, you know, like it there's much less frustration on my part now because yes. it's, it's really, cause I'm helping them do the work, right. To get I, th I think it's a little better too, because it's, I've looked at all sticking points, either, either being mental, physical or technical. Yeah. And what, what I would normally always be asked is, Hey, yeah. what exercise should I do to increase my bench yeah. or what exercise to increase my lockout or yeah. what exercise It was always what exercise. And it's yeah. like, okay, you're assuming that this is the physical problem yeah. and that it's the strength issue. More yeah. than likely, your technique sucks. And if right. you fix that, you're going to put 50 more pounds on the lift, right? Yeah. Or, you know, it, there's other variables, but they want that quick. Oh, yeah, of course. Here's what it is, and it's the, never that. Yeah. It's like it's the clickbait title, right? Yeah. Just one weird trick, and then you get, you know. And then there's the assumption that, that yes, there's this miracle exercise. It just happens to fix everybody's lockout. Yeah, right. Which, come on, that doesn't happen either. You yeah. know, and it's I do think that's gotten a little bit better yeah. with the – there's a lot of things that are good with the overabundance of information yeah. that's out there. Oh, for sure. And, you know, I'm not one to really bitch about it that much because I think most of it's easily vettable. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, yeah, you, you can tell pretty enough, quick, like, this is bullshit. Right. I mean, you don't need a big radar detector or yeah. a medical degree to know that 80% of this is bullshit. Yeah, for sure. You know, now your patients, they, they might, yeah, that, that's, needs a, that's a different story. A different perspective. Yeah. But the rest it's, there's, there's good stuff out there that they yeah. can vet down through. Absolutely. Um, 
Is there a question that you wished I would have asked that I didn't ask today or something that, or a message that you want to put out there or something that yeah. you were thinking that we would discuss that we didn't? Um, I can't think of anything specific. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's really, listen, I mean, this, I told you, this is, this is awesome. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you having me here. Yeah. Um, big thing. I mean, I am, you know, definitely always open for, you know, I'm not trying to like make it a plug, but like, you know, I'm, I'm, always taking more clients, you know, more people mm -hmm. I can help out. Um, well, I was going to ask, how can they find you? Oh yeah. yeah standard yeah. stuff like that. Sure. So you can find me, uh, rpstrength.com. Mm -hmm. Um, basically. So I do nutrition, weight training, coaching, uh, primarily powerlifting background, like we've been talking about, but I do take care of people, you know, weight loss or muscle gain, however you want to go about it. I mean, everything's customized for each person and everything like that. Um, you know, it's kind of like from the medical side of things, like, if there are any Chicago land tradesmen listening, you know, mm -hmm. come see me, please, you know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. come see your doctor. Um, yeah, that's the big thing, man. Just as many people as I can help out, you know, I, I hope that I can, I know I can bring something unique to the coaching experience. You know, I, I have the, the medical slant, you know, or not, you know, the medical background, I've got the piloting background. Chances are any, any challenge you've run into, I've probably run into it myself, either with a client or with my own kind of fitness, you know, strength journey, if you can call it that. Um, so, you know, if I can help somebody not have to go through some of the same shit, like, you know, that, that makes me happy, not just because I've got, you know, clients, but like, I mean, it really is rewarding having people like yeah. make progress and get better and stuff like that. Links are in the description, by the way. The, um, being involved in both worlds, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Where do you see the future of how they interact move, right? Because mm -hmm. some will say that it's getting further apart yeah. because of meds and all the other mm -hmm. kind of things. Others will say that it's coming closer together. I'd like to think it's coming closer together, but you're yeah. in both worlds. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's like over and over again, re research backs up, you know, like exercise is fantastic for you, right? It helps, you know, promote long life and all this other stuff. I just saw a headline the other day that even two minute bursts of exercise, two minutes with a total of 15 minutes per week can add years to your life. So it's like, we'd be really foolish not to incorporate that into like actual just regular medicine, preventative yeah, care. But my pushback would be, you're yeah. not having exercise science people coming in to buy your lunch. True. As you do pharmaceutical reps True. every day. <laughs> oh, I wish, man. They don't let us. But yeah. I hear what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, there's, that's, that is the, the slimy part of medicine. There's no yeah. denying it. You know, I mean, it, they are powerful tools at our disposal. There's a lot of value in it. I'm not going to sit here and say I don't prescribe anything because I do no, I mean, prescribe all the time. Yeah, but, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, it's true. There's, there's, and without getting like political, it's, challenging for me mentally just to look at it as like like yeah I, I directly benefit from getting paid to be a doctor but like i don't want people to be stuck behind a paywall to get help right if somebody's yeah. got high blood pressure and they're like well i can't go to the doctor because it's gonna bankrupt me it's like well it's awful man everybody should have access to care you yeah. know whatever version of that it is mm -hmm. i want everybody to have access to care you know even though you know trying to make a decent living is what got me interested in medicine many years ago. Like really what kept me in it is, you know, you want to genuinely help people. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, if I go home at the end of the day, like I sleep well at night knowing I'm not, you know, I'm not fucking anybody over. Cause yeah. like, you know, helping them get better, whatever way, you know, whether it's their mental health, their physical health, their, you know, exercise health, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's, that's really the goal. So, and I would, really like to think that the vast, vast majority of physicians and healthcare providers, you know, NPs, PAs, all that stuff, everybody's probably in it more or less for the same reason, right? You want to help people. Otherwise, there's, there's so many other ways to make money than going into medicine where you don't have to sacrifice your 20s or whenever, mm -hmm. you know, there are people in their 40s going to school for this stuff too. But like, there's so many other ways to do it where you don't get saddled with, you know, half a million dollars in debt. It's just... So I, I would like to think that the medical community generally wants to help people. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made in healthcare because that's the direction things went. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is also like a cultural shift and, you know, each generation has a little bit more kind of awareness of it. You know, like there's like people, you know, kind of closer to my generation and our generation, um, very different approach to the diet exercise piece than, you know, like my, my, gran my grandma's doctor 
you know, would, would push all kinds of nonsense. It's like, where did you even come up with that shit, man? Mm-hmm. It's like, no, no, there was no science backing it. It was just like, yeah, go do this. It's like, okay, well, there's that. Versus now, like, I have a lot more of, like, my younger patients that come in, they're exercising. They're dieting. Well, you know, they're at least conscious of what they're <laughs> eating. So it's like, that gives me hope that there is more of a shift towards that. You know, I think, um, like, the model that we have with our, our medical group um, is getting to be more popular. Like, not just with our company, but, like other big organizations are doing something similar where it's like more of a wellness approach and you have more time with patients and stuff like that. It's like a a baked in cost and stuff. So I think that lowers the barrier, excuse me, for care for a lot of people. And if we can continue to shift that, that mindset of like, you know, medicine isn't just pills. It's, you know, it's, if we can get people really active and eating right, we're going to save ourselves so much money, so much effort and like suffering and all that stuff, you know, and, you know, COVID it revealed a lot of things. And one of the things it showed was, that, you know, people like, as you can imagine, people that weren't as healthy didn't do as well, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And I think for some people it was a big wake up call of like, man, I don't, I don't want to be in that risky category anymore. So it's time to, time to get in shape, time to start walking, you know, all those things. So the optimist in me says that they should be getting closer. Okay. You know, maybe the realist is if we can put a price on it, it'll get even closer. Right? Well, the, the, the other thing, <laughs> the other part that I was kind of wondering yeah. with that is, as you said, you know, COVID did expose to a lot of people, yeah. you know, maybe I should be in shape, Yeah. you know, and I think for a small period of time, it, it did shift a lot of behavior yeah. during that time. Mm-hmm. What I don't know is, you know, I'm, I live in a bubble, right. You know, yeah. is, is that, has that maintained or has it dropped back down pre-COVID? Uh, it's hard for me to, to say based on my population because they're, they're unique anyway, but yeah, um, the, yeah, true. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've seen some people sustain it, you know, unfortunately, as, as everybody knows, I mean, there's a lot of other, you know, negative that came out yeah. during all that, you know, all the substance abuse and depression and all that stuff. But, um, I, you know, I, I have seen some people though that are taking their health more seriously now. You know, because either they had an issue or a loved one did or just, you know, being aware of what's going on in the world and stuff. So, you know, I would definitely did. So I guess the, the big message across all this is like just just get checked out, you know, in the very least get checked out mm-hmm. because you don't know what you don't know. So it's like you might as well find out. So if there's something easy, you can, you know, because like I was talking about before, my blood pressure wasn't terrible. But like had I just, you know, put the steps in a little bit, watch mm-hmm. the salt a little bit you know, maybe I wouldn't be in the position I'm in now where, again, you know, I'm not on death's door, but like, it took a lot of effort to get back to like more normal, which is a pain in the ass. I didn't get to keep doing the sport that I love. It's not entirely why I quit. We never really kind of got into that, but I hurt my back and then it got Mm -hmm. better and all that stuff. But anyways, um, yeah, I'd say just, just get checked out, you know, take care of yourself. Do the, do the basics and the bare minimum, you know, the walking, healthy diet, try not to eat too much crap. I mean, it's there. I, I tell patients all the time too, though, there's no fun. There's no reason to live to 99 if, if you're not enjoying yourself. So like finding that balance of, mm-hmm. you know, maybe it's 80, 20, maybe 80% of the time you're pretty healthy. 20% of the time you can do whatever you want. But yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank you for coming out. <laughs> yeah. You know, thank you, you guys me, for listening. And my close for the show is we're done and we yeah. just stop. So we're done. <laughs> <laughs> just fade off into the sunset. Huh?